Oh, my goodness. Can you believe it's another episode of The Best Show? What can you do, right? On a Tuesday night, what's better to do than to sit back? The whole family crowd around the old Vic Trolley sitting on the rug. Can you believe people did that? They actually sat together. No fidget spinners or anything to kind of keep your hands occupied. There were no second screens when the family sat and listened to The Shadow or Fibber McGee and Molly. They didn't have... And to be sitting there and just like have watched, can you imagine watching something with your grandparents? Oh my God. Can you imagine things I watch with my grandparents? Hee haw. Look, hee haw from New Jersey. What do we got in common with hee haw? Nothing. But I do want to apologize to, uh, right off the bat, I want to apologize to. Best show producer, Jason Gore. You don't have to come in for this, Jason. You can just listen to this apology. But I want to apologize. As the show an hour ago, I got coffee from Coffee Bean for for the for everybody working on the show. I said, sent out a text. Who wants what? Jason told me what he wanted. Uh, Rebo, Brett Bohm wanted something. Uh, Big Dog, Brett Davis didn't want nothing. Andrew holding it down behind the console. Look, it's not about that. I got them. But I come back with it. And Jason says, so do you go to the uh, coffee bean that's up the street? And then I said, no, I go to one very far away. For no reason, I was incredibly sarcastic. And I apologize to Jason for that you don't deserve that level of mistreatment on the show and i apologize and i hope you can find it in your heart to forgive me i go and i do go to one that's close by i don't know why i said that no i go to one very very far away and sure everyone laughed at me and jason Inched the mask up over his face a little bit further. Started to use it to hide behind. And I felt bad. It's not who I am. I apologize. Yeah, Brett was laughing, slapping his knee, slapping, loved watching. Because they all love watching each other get cooked. It's very competitive. I run this show like Saturday Night Live where there's more people than slots. <laughs> And that just creates fear. It's fear-based. Just like Lauren Michael does. Um, but I says to you right now, enough is enough. It's best show time. Best show. Best show. Best show. Keep on laughing with the radio
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Best show. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Tom. I'm the host of the show this week. I want to welcome you all back here in August of 2022. Can you believe that? It's August of 2022. Uh, yeah, I didn't play any theme, uh, any any uh, music other than the theme. Why? Because uh, this is how the best show works now in 2022. You don't know what we're going to do. We got more going on here than you could ever imagine. All these other shows, they say they got a guest and they that's all they got. We got so many moving pieces on this thing. And you're all starting to realize it. That this show's just a cut above the rest. It's like a pizza box, baby. You tried the rest, now you try the best. Right? And Dudio, I would like to apologize sincerely for that jab at you. I went to um, Coffee Bean and I said... And by the way, this Coffee Bean up the street uh, might as well double as a... uh, Freaking Burt Kreischer lookalike contest uh, holding area. Every guy is has that Burt Kreischer. Or they look like that or they look like they work at Dennis Leary's production company. They're all like those aggressive yeah. bald guys with the angry. They all look angry. And then some of them have beat, like tough guy beards and other ones just are even clean shaven. It's just a intense vibe. That's all of Toluca Lake. That's the whole neighborhood is that. Mm-hmm. Well, I learned my lesson. Yeah. You, I came in and you kindly said, oh, so did you go to the Starbucks, uh, the, the coffee bean that's uh, nearby? And I said, no, I go to the one very, <laughs> very far away. And, and everyone laughed. Yeah. And suddenly I'm back in high school throwing out a zinger. Yeah. And I reaping the spoils while somebody else silently stews yeah, and I've, plots revenge. I'm going to talk to my mom about it tonight. That's please. Oh, so mom, I'm going to talk uh, to my mom. I'm going to say, mom, I'm doing it again. <laughs> no, I just, that's not how it works. Yeah. I didn't do that. I got, I was. No, you were in best show mode. You weren't even Tom. Don't excuse it. No, don't I, excuse it. I understand it. Don't excuse it. Well, you I, understand I it. I understand it. Yeah, but that's no excuse. What, what okay. would be the excuse? What, does does the Hulk make an excuse when he's that <laughs> way? No, he doesn't. He well, he actually does. He this is what I said when I was bullied I in can't high school. Help it. You know, I was like, I understand it. Well, that's terrible. I'd now bully truly, me too. You, oh, that's the hard. It's okay, Tom. I'd bully me too. Okay. Now I, it's going to be hard for me to throw you out of the studio. <laughs> even now, even more. Thank you, Jason. Jason, anything you want okay. from any coffee bean. From now on, you tell me which coffee bean you want me to go to, and okay. I will go to it. Pasadena. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Um, but as I was saying, on the show, right off the bat, surprise guest. First of all, can we put the air conditioning on, uh, please, here? Thank you, Andrew. Not sure if I'm supposed to be uh, doing an episode of the show or uh, taking a hot yoga class. Hot yoga class. No, we have in the studio, right off the bat, there's a, a, an award-winning director, guy who made movies. These movies are heading into the Bs, the billions, when this guy, this the box office, this guy's on this guy's rep. Director of Bring It On, Down With Love, The Breakup, Ant-Man, Ant-Man 2, Ant-Man 3, and more. We have Peyton Reed swinging by just to say hi. How are you, Peyton? Oh, Tom. Uh, <laughs> I'm good. I I, uh, I just... Uh, I just finished uh, doing a, a day of some visual effects shots. Okay. Some pickups, we call that in, in the business. And this is for Ant-Man 3? No, no. There's no Ant-Man 2 <laughs> and Ant-Man. There's Ant-Man. There's Ant-Man and the Wasp. Uh-huh. And now there is Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Okay. Okay. So this was for Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. That's too much to say. Quantumania. 
Quantum mania. Yeah, just it's like you know, it's like quadrophenia. Just say quantum mania. Okay. Yeah. I don't understand what's wrong with saying Ant Man three. Well, it's the voice, really. <laughs> That's what's wrong with it. That's, it's a little grating. Yeah. Kind of jarring. Yeah. Gets on it gets under your skin a little bit. I, I mean, yeah. I know I know that's one of the uh, arrows in your quiver, but yeah, like Hawkeye. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, that's right. Like Hawkeye, another another Marvel, right? Yeah, Hawkeye or Green Arrow if you're uh, a fan of the distinguished competition. Mm, DC. Yeah. Now, Peyton. First of all, I just want to say this, just like I cleared the air with. Jason, a minute yeah. ago for my shooting my mouth off like a big shot. Yeah. Back on the playground again. You've been you've been unfairly uh dragged on this show for nine years, I would say. Is a fair when would when did Ant Man come out? Nine well, years ago? We shot Ant Man in 2014. It came out in 2015. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So a good seven years you've been on the wrong end of me saying, I got cut out of Ant-Man. Yeah, I mean, I'll take your word for it. I don't listen to the show, but I oh, that's, that's... There we go. You know, sure. See, there should be a scoreboard behind us, and it should just say, like, yeah. read one, like <laughs> on that one. Yeah. <laughs> like, it should just, like, yeah. the judges hold up their <laughs> scores and be like, 9.9 for Peyton Reed on that one. Um, no, you... The, the story goes, I went to the set for Ant-Man, Ant, Ant-Man. Yes. I'll say it the right way, Ant-Man. Thank you, man. Thank you. And then it was like, hey, you want to be in a scene? Sell, sell Ant-Man a lottery ticket. Well, Scott. He wasn't dressed as Ant-Man at the time. Yeah, and let me, you're skipping on an important thing, which is uh, myself, Paul Rudd, the star of Ant-Man. Mm-hmm. Play Scott Lang, yeah, Ant Man, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, our producer at the time, Brad Winderbaum, and then mm -hmm. it must be said, Kevin Feige, the head of Marvel, yeah, all comedy fans, mm -hmm. they all know who Tom Sharpling is. Oh, well, look at that! Can and you wait, uh, say that again. I missed. I couldn't hear what you said. I think my headphones might be shorting out. No, no, no. They uh, they're aware of Tom Sharpling. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and, aware uh, makes it sound like. There's like I downgraded. A photo it. No, no, I downgraded the, like, it. After like, you, when you begged for it, I downgraded. Yeah, like it's a photo behind the counter to not <laughs> let this guy in your store. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, uh -huh. they, uh, you, you were on their radar. <laughs> That's even worse. It makes it sound like they're and, they think uh, I'm coming after them or well, something. This is just you know, this is this is Hollywood. This is how it works. Sure, this is so. It's not uh, called show friendship. Everybody. So we uh, we sh there was a scene in the original Ant Man. Mm -hmm. Uh, where Scott Lang is buying a lottery ticket. Yeah. And he's buying it at a, just a corner uh, store or uh, the bodega. Mm -hmm. And uh, we needed someone capable yeah. who had an instant rapport with comedy legend Paul Rudd. Yeah. And uh, at that mm -hmm. time, uh, uh, soon to be superhero. So who did, who did we call? Tom Sharpley. Yeah, that's right. And we shot a scene. Uh, I remember. Slid him a lottery ticket. Sold him a lottery ticket. You're behind the counter patiently mm -hmm. waiting as he fills out a lottery ticket for this montage that eventually mm -hmm. got um, cut from the movie. Yes. Did not make the final cut of the movie. And was that because, like, performing now suddenly it's like, Paul's not so good. Like, we're starting to see. Was that? Was there any of that in there? Like, what's the percentage? Paul, did you say Paul's not so good? <laughs> yeah. Like, um, like, maybe Paul should be selling him little Tom the lottery ticket. I don't remember. F I don't remember feeling that specifically uh -huh. when we were shooting the thing. Mm -hmm. I felt quite good about it. I, mm -hmm. I felt like okay, Tom acquitted himself nicely in this scene. Tom held his own with with yeah. Paul. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, there it is. There's the that's a still from there. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. the problem is. We cut the entire montage out of it. It's, yeah. it's suddenly story wise. When you get into editorial, it just didn't fit. Yeah, we didn't. had to cut it, and un unfortunately, we had to throw the uh, the baby out with cutting the room one. floor. Yeah, happens all the time. It does. So then the phone rings, Ant Man and the Wasp. Yes. Now we're in 2017. Yes. I'm back in Atlanta, Georgia, shooting a sequel. Saying, "Get down here." Yeah. You're gonna be. 
you and John Worcester. That's right. Are going to be a couple of goons. Yeah. We for need Walton oh, there and there it is right there. Look oh, at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, That's so you there. have <laughs> photographic That's evidence that this happened. Horrifying. Yeah. I So then Wait, go can you go back to go back to this uh-huh. shot of the uh, yeah, the lottery ticket. That. Yeah. Now go go to the lottery one from Ant Man. Yeah. Look, look at look at this. This is like um you're in a Scorsese movie there. You're you're really you're yeah. given you know, Oh no, no, I'm this not patron around. is wasting your time. Who is this guy off the street who I don't yeah. know is Ant Man? And uh I, I like what you did there. There's truth to that performance. My character, whose name was um, Sal. Sal, thank you for remembering. He is saying, Why is the most handsome person I've ever seen in front of me coming into my bodega to buy a lottery ticket. Mm -hmm. Then I'm just saying, I don't care. Business is business. Yeah. I can sell to the most handsome person I've ever seen just as easily as I'll sell to one of these normies that usually come in. Yeah. And you said all that with your eyes, which was yeah. hard to do. Thank you. And I appreciate I, I knew you'd catch that. but um, I will just so. say, I, I remember seeing your performance and thinking, like, this guy, is, this guy could be the mm-hmm. new Danny Aiello. <laughs> Please. From your lips to God's ears. So then the, the call comes in for Ant-Man and the Wasp. Uncuttable scene. This is uncut. We've mapped out this uh, chase mm-hmm. sequence throughout uh, San Francisco. Mm-hmm. There's shrinking and growing vehicles and stuff. They're chasing after our heroes, and uh, I need a couple of goons who are driving a, an mm-hmm. SUV. Yeah, and they're chasing Hope Van Dyne, and they uh, the van shrinks down. They, they yeah. all these things happen. Yeah, yeah. Uncuttable. Yeah, uncuttable. Until I cut it. <laughs> and the reason I cut it again. <laughs> uh huh. Uh, is I'm glad we're clearing the air about this honestly yeah. because I do feel like uh, mm-hmm. it's just been it's been hanging out there for a long time. Yeah, we have not resolved this, and it's a little painful. I'll I'll admit it's painful. But then, so then you know, again, you in the process of a movie, you want to get it tight. You want to get it so that you know this is the third act. Things are cooking in the third mm-hmm. act, and it's fast, and it yeah, didn't make yeah. sense. Why are we suddenly spending time with these two characters? Uh, you know, the reaction is you kind of go to that shot and it's like, well, wait, who who are these guys? And mm-hmm. it just, uh, it didn't make sense. It was not a performance related issue at all. I want to say that in front Thank of you, you, you here I, in your own studio and to your that. audience. I appreciate that because I feel like, I feel like since then, my acting career has really hit the skids. Well, define skids. I, I don't. I've not worked since. Since Ant Man and the Wasp, but well, we'll we'll, we'll, we'll it. talk about that. Yeah. Um. So then, there's a press conference for Ant Man and the Wasp, yes. and this happens. And a, a, a listener, a listener, the, the being a listener is not a full time job. They the listeners have jobs, and this listener's job was to it works in media. And he addresses a question to you at the Ant-Man press conference. And it goes a little something like this. Let's see. We'll play the short clip. Uh, Have there been any talks about you returning for a third film in the series? And if you do, will you be cutting Tom Sharpling from that movie too? (laughs) (laughs) Well, um... (laughs) I'm all hooting it up. Hooting it up. Yeah, that's that's real funny. I'm on a I'm on a stage with two time Academy Award winner Michael Douglas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Paul Rudd, Evangeline <laughs> Lilly. Mm-hmm. I, I you know I don't know who else was there. Was uh, Michelle Pfeiffer on the stage? Maybe I think there were uh, some heavy hitters Lawrence up there. Fishburne was Fishburne there. Was there. Mm-hmm. Fishburne. Oh, excuse me. Fish was there. Fish. Fish was fish. there, and Ooh. he had he suddenly confronted with mm-hmm. this uh, this yeah. name and this yeah. accusation, and yeah. Uh, I would, I'll say this. Yeah. Truth be told, when they all didn't walk out, I was a little disappointed. Of the just, press conference, based on that. Just for, like to support a fellow member of the arts. Mm-hmm. They just didn't go, you know what? In solidarity, they were yeah. supposed to just quietly or maybe loudly exit the podium and they'd look at me first. Yeah. Shake their head. They'd look at you. They'd maybe do Shame this. me. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, like Rudy, like the movie Rudy, when they all laid their football jerseys <laughs> yeah. on the coach's desk. Yeah. Which, 
also didn't happen in real life. <laughs> so that's why I guess that's the through line there. Yeah. Didn't happen. Now here is where the universe is against me and not Peyton Reed. Because also backstage you got chewed out uh, for kicking me off the movie. <laughs> <laughs> what? I got chewed out. <laughs> Did somebody chew you out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a, there was someone. I, it was actually I think it was Michael Douglas. Uh-huh, I yeah. think I told this. I, I, I he's like, <laughs> Peyton, who who was that? Uh, the guy in the audience talking about the t- Sharpling. I said, well, Michael, it's Tom Sharpling. He's a he's an old friend. We shot a thing for Ant Man. We had to cut him. He's like, Jesus Christ, this guy's your friend. <laughs> and. uh so I was shamed. Mm-hmm. I was shamed by two-time yeah. Academy Award-winning Michael Douglas. Yeah. Junior. Because of one of your listeners. Uh-huh. And that is, and I thought, I went off in a corner and I reflected. I remember mm-hmm. reflecting in yeah. real time on this thing. And it's like, I reflected on uh, your rising power in, mm-hmm. in the media landscape at that point. And uh, yeah. I was uh, not happy about it in that moment. Mm-hmm. But then as I reflected more, I was like, well, that's good for Tom. Yeah, yeah, and I appreciated the solidarity came there. It was not as performative as I would have liked, but I'll take it where I can get it. So Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania comes rolling around, and I am ready. Early March, get ready. The lights are going to be turned on. (laughs) Tom, third time's the charm. And I just, okay, I'm going to my wardrobe fitting. You're skipping over. You got the call. I got the call. Here's the time. You're here We figured it out. And this was a killer part. Uncuttable. This is uncuttable. This Kang. one is really a, not Kang. You were never in the running for Kang. The mm-hmm. Conqueror. Okay. Well, Did I tell you that at the time? These are the two parts I, w- I wanted for Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Kang the Conqueror. Mm-hmm. Or I wanted to be the guy who says, you can't do that to Ant-Man. He's like our the, guy. Yeah, the citizen. Yeah. I wanted to be the citizen. Hey, yeah. you can't do that to Ant-Man. Yeah. Yeah. Try try, uh, try it one more time. Uh-huh. A little less gruff, a little less guttural. Hey, Just, you can't do that to Ant-Man. Try one more. This time, do it in that voice that when you said Ant-Man 2, yeah, Ant, yeah, give me that yeah, one. Okay. Hey, you can't do that to Ant-Man. Yes. Yes. Okay, we got okay. it. Moving on. Wait, so I just shot a scene? We got it. Okay. Yes. Great. Well, that was fast. So you get a call. I get a call. We got a scene for you. I'm not going to say what scene it is because that's not fair to other, if people are, if the, you know, I don't know. Like spoilers. When people, yeah. But also just don't like when people who were in a scene, you know, you know what I mean? Find out they were not the first one meant for the scene. I just don't, I think that's just. I just don't think that's the nicest thing in the world when yes. you find out. You yeah, know, yeah, you know yeah. What I mean? Sure. Whatever. Fair enough. That's fair. Yes. That's how I run my sets. I don't know. You run your You're sets. You're a gentleman. Um, call comes in. Go to wardrobe fitting. Oh, just got to take a uh, rudimentary, uh, perfunct. It is just a matter of principle. COVID test just to go to the thing. Boing. Second line pops up. Got COVID. And I'm like, this thing shoots in a week. And I got this COVID, and I'm going to just be sitting at home watching Love Island. Been perfect health, and I can't be on that set. This is cosmically unfair. Fast forward one day, I'm wondering if I'm going to die from COVID. Because it was, it turns out (laughs) the bad one was still hanging around. Everybody else had the easy one at that point, where they're like, oh, it turns out I had COVID last week. Yeah. It was kind of like I just had the sniffles and uh, I was, but uh, yeah, I just stayed inside and watched TV. What's a big deal? Everybody talking about COVID. <laughs> yeah, I had it. It was just like, it wasn't even like a cold. I'm like, I got COVID. I got COVID. It's going to be so awful that I'm going to be healthy and that I wasn't healthy. So it's probably a good thing I didn't go uh, on set because everybody would have been very sick. Yeah. So. Yeah, so that happened. Didn't make it to Ant Man and the Wasp, Quantum Mania. Yeah. So be it. 
So but tell me when it opens, and I'll I'll well, be there. Okay, I'll so, be first one online cheering. Now you and I, Tom, we had a conversation about there's a there's a pickup shoot coming mm-hmm. up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. September seventeenth. Yeah. September seventeenth. Uh huh. Which you, I think, when we spoke last week, said you might be able to do. You can check my dates. I got to check still your check dates. My dates. Okay. Well, I'm moving a few things around. The Why reason. Is that? I came by mm-hmm. tonight. Yeah. Oh, no. I was not expecting to do this in real time, but, and this is serious. I'm not, yeah. this is not a gag. Okay. Yeah. This is actually serious right now. Yeah. Okay. So this, the scene we were planning to shoot, yeah. which, which was going to be, this is not a spoiler, but it was going to be in San Francisco. Yeah. Um, we have had to cut. Oh. So. And this is serious. This is serious. But. We were supposed to shoot it, and uh, again, through editorial, and there's some some budgetary issues with that particular thing. It was a very quick scene. Mm-hmm. Sure. But as you and I discussed, it was a very clear, okay, this is this is the one. This is, we're going to get you, and now. Um, They're not. But I'm holding, but there's still a, ch- yeah, there's yeah. still, there is still, um, I probably should not have done this on the air. I'm looking at your face right now. And I. I I probably cut. Uh, I got pre-cut. Yeah. Well, okay, but that's for that one. There, Third uh, time's the harm. Not yet. It's not over yet. I'm looking at you. Yeah. I should not have done this you live. Done I'm this sorry, man. But we. So there's yeah. there's a couple of well, options. This is gonna be a fun rest of the episode. I so no, but say. hold on. There's yeah. a couple of things yeah. I'll talk oh, to you about. Oh, there oh, are okay. there are okay. some opportunities still after yeah. that thing. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like you're actually in shock right now. Oh, I really am. No, no, no. There, there's this, there's some opportunities okay. coming up that I think we can figure out, but okay. I can't talk to you about it on, on sure. We get an Ant Man sweatshirt. No, no, it's not. It's not, it's not a swag opportunity. Okay. It's a. It's a. Um, <sighs> Guys, thanks for listening. To the best show. Uh, we had a good one. This is a fun episode. Can I? Can I? Be- I'm glad there's video now because people can literally watch me start to die a little bit inside can i before i feel like i'm yeah, getting yeah, yeah, no i feel yeah. like you might actually yeah. kick me out but uh-huh. before yeah. before that happens uh-huh. yeah um and the wasp quantum mania opens february 17th please yeah uh 2023 mm-hmm. um what am i supposed to say something like see it on the biggest screen imaginable something like supposed that supposed to say turn it up uh, uh, yeah yeah See it in, uh, yeah, the biggest screen imaginable. If you want, I don't know how, I don't know how it works, but if you like want to put on a pre-tape thing and we can go out and hash this out, but I'll, we'll, we'll. No, no, I want to, but I do want to thank Peyton Reed for coming by, the director. Oh, First man. of many, I think I would just, you know, I can come by and we can ha- whatever oh, you need uh, to talk we'll, about. We'll sort this through. It's great. Yeah, yeah. it's gonna be. I think we can figure something out, though. Can we bring a cot in for me? A cot? So I can just lay down. We do the show laying down. Rest of the show laying down. No, this is great. This was this was a this was a great experience. Um, it's Tom, it's not great. I can see you. No, I know no, you're trying great. to put it. I know you're trying it's to. Fun. Let's thank everybody. Famous person on the line. Famous person on the he's line. He's not on the line, but he's a famous person who came by. And now that also this news that I have been pre-cut from Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania makes this a news event. And I guess that qualifies as a, a scoop. So I will say. Come on, give us a scoop. And the scoop is, I'm not going to be an Ant-Man Three, Ant Man and the. Sorry, I, I want to get it right because I am just so behind it now. Um, <laughs> look at that! Is the I get a thing. Look at the screen, and then I look at the screen, and it's me <laughs> being <laughs> breaking news. It is breaking news. Thank you for the. Thank you for the news. Uh, this is the the. Oh my goodness. And boy, that's a great, I, I got to still say, I love that camera angle that's on me right now so much. Because in case I just wonder whether I look like a homunculus or not, and that gives all the confirmation I need. 
Uh, we're going to be doing some camera tests, that's all I'm going to say. We're going to be doing some camera tests. That's a great angle on me, though. Oh, because no, that's that's amazing. You look amazing. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Peyton Reed, thanks for coming by. In all seriousness, thanks for coming by. I appreciate it. Thank you're, you for having me, Tom. I, I hope that maybe you could find it in your heart to, to have me again at some point. Oh, of course, anytime you want. You come by anytime you want, my friend. Your voice just cracked. Yeah, a little bit. Um, let's uh, let's wrap this up because yeah. no. In all seriousness, thanks for coming by. Thanks for having me. You were me just time. swinging by to say hi. Yep. And you brought some news. Yep. But um, that's fun. Yep. So I appreciate it. I. <clears throat> <laughs> let's um. Let's go to the phones. Hot phones. I'm being told the phones are hot tonight. Is that true? The phones are still hot. Because the topic is. The topic tonight is what are the dumb things you believed as a kid? And thank you, uh, Brett Davis, for that graphic that makes me feel dumb. Even lower, because when I was a child, I'll start it off. When I was a child, <clears throat> I remember thinking because of the map that Hawaii and Alaska were close to each other. Which makes no sense, because one's cold and one's hot. But don't put the ma them on the map like that. Why couldn't they make a map that had Hawaii where it's supposed to be? Is that so hard? Think about the logic of that. They'd rather jam these things closer together on a map that is factually inaccurate rather than just figure out a map that shows where they actually are. I'm going to say as a child, I was not wrong on that one. The map makers were wrong. Shame on you, map makers. And also, Didn't you have access to a globe, Tom? What's that now? Didn't you have access to a globe? Oh, what am I supposed to? I'm supposed to proofread a map? Is that what you're suggesting, AP Mike? No, no. One of those, you know, globes, you know, physical globes. Yes, I know what a physical globe <laughs> is, but if I got my hands on a map, why is that not enough? Well, if you had the globe first, you you would have you would have known it was wrong. If, if, <laughs> Mike, if ifs and buts were globes in Mike, my Mike, childhood, Mike, if ifs and buts <laughs> were candies and nuts, we'd all have a hell of a Christmas. And you said that, Carl Yastrzemski, from the. Boston Red Sox. We'll talk to you soon enough, Mike. Keep your keep your shirt on. Look at that map. Makes me feel dumb. Stupid. Knew I should have. Knew I should have done that thing in Batgirl. It's the only thing I. I got going for me. So the directors from Batgirl want me to do a thing. I got that up my sleeve, though. I don't need this ant man. I got Batgirl. I should have said yes. I'm going to call him up first thing in the morning. I'm calling those guys up and saying, I'm in. They want me to, hey, you can't do that to Batgirl. Batgirl. Hey, you can't do that to Batgirl. I'm going to be in bat. I'm saying right now, DC number one. This is the order of comic book. Com DC, Image, Dark Horse, IGH. Is an IGH one? I don't know. Oni Press, Dollar. Who put Richie Rich out? Wasn't that Dollar? Gold Key. Gold key. Gold key, then Marvel. Maybe. Charlton. Ch Charlton, yes. Gold, I want even those golden books I'm putting ahead of Marvel. I'm putting those golden books ahead with, uh, you know, pa Patty the Puppy is lost. Help him find his way home. Richard Scary is better than Marvel. I actually believe that. I want to say this. If they're going to do a movie about that worm with the little uh, oompapa hat on, the, uh, I want to. I want at least get a voiceover audition for that worm. Driving that apple around. All right, I'm gonna. Uh, 
I'm going to play a song and we'll be right back. How's that sound? Does that sound good? Play a song. We'll be right back with our friend Lana Del Rey. Mm. Yeah. Lana Del Rey. Mariner's apartment complex. Man. So, for people who don't know, that was real. That was real. I just got cut out of Ant Man 3 on the air. Yeah. Yeah, got cut again. I don't, I wouldn't want to be in it anyway, though. I didn't want to be in it. That's, I was kind of doing them a favor, ultimately. Um, yeah, I was doing them a favor. Well, you know what? We got a great show for you tonight. We got uh, Ronnie Bronstein is going to be on. Who is the guy who co-writes the Safety Brothers movies? Good time. Uncut Gems. Daddy Long Legs. Which just came out on Criterion last week. Along with... Ronnie's movie that he directed and wrote, Frownland. And we're going to talk to Ronnie about all those things. And, yeah. I'm going to go to the phones now. I'm going to go to the phones. And then we'll talk more about the topic. What are the dumb things you believed as a kid? I told you about mine. Um, yeah, let's do it to it. Here we go to the phones. Hello, best show. What up, douche? Ploptron 6000 in the his house. <laughs> Ploptron 6000. I, I adjusted for inflation. Yeah, I guess it would have been uh, a little bit of inflation because you were the Ploptron 3000 before. Oh, gosh. I think I think it's going up every couple of years. I feel like I was it was 5000 last time, wasn't it? I guess so. I always think of Power Man 5000, but I forget that there was also the Ploptron 5000. This is Darren. Is that one of your toys or something? No, it's not one of my toys. What, the, what a Power Man 5000? Yeah, it was one a ba- of your, it was, it, one of your little toys that you collect. I don't collect little toys, Darren. And this, for people who don't know, this is a coworker of mine. This is Darren. How are you, Darren? I'm a little more than a coworker. Well, good. I mean, we've known each other most of our lives. I'm a little more than a coworker. Mm-hmm. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Hey, um, can I chime in on the, on the topic? Oh, yeah, yeah. Please. The topic so, also it, being the dumb it, things. The dumb things you thought uh, were real when you were a kid. Like things you believed. Things right? you believed. Yeah, exactly. What were the dumb things you okay, believed okay, when well, you were a kid? Right. Well, I, I wasn't going to bring this up, but... Um, I think all those Tommy heads out there are going to find it uh, quite delicious. Um, do you remember the very unusual thing that you believed well into your late teens? Mm, yeah. <laughs> um, can I say what it was, please? Oh, man. I mean, I assume you don't believe it anymore. Uh 
Okay. It's funny. Come okay. On. Yeah, it's funny. It's funny. Cause well, yeah, it's I'm funny. Sorry. Go ahead, Darren. All right. Well, uh, <laughs> you thought that you would become a literal living God if you possessed that rarest of wacky packages, the Jiffy Poop popcorn misprint that showed you know what exploding out of that that foil. There was only ever one, ever only one pack made that that made it out of the factory. That's why it's so rare. Mm-hmm. I I thought I would ascend. Yeah, it was very weird. Like you were very into it. Um, of course, you never did get it. But um, I don't know if you've heard this. I read that Elon Musk has it in a safe next to the pistol that John Wilkes Booth used to injure Abraham Lincoln. That he has. The, wait, the the Darren. This is mind blowing. The one card, the one wacky package, card. Yes. Yeah. Who who has it? Elon Musk. Elon That's what I read. Elon Musk got that one card that got out of the factory. Yeah, yeah, and um, it, it's apparently it, you know it's one of his most pri- prized possessions, and it, it's in a safe right next to the pistol that John Wilkes Booth used to injure Abraham Lincoln back then. Yeah. I don't know if that gun was used to injure Abraham Lincoln. Well, you know, he's still alive, right? Who? Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln is still alive. Yeah. I, I, I saw a, um, it was kind of blurry, but it was a photo of him on a on a Reddit page, and I, I gotta say, he looks good for two hundred and thirteen. Da- Darren, you gotta be more careful with this stuff. You gotta be more careful with this stuff. This is you're believing right, well, the things you see on Reddit. Well, yeah, I mean it's it's it's, in, it's printed, so. Well. That, that doesn't someone, mean someone took the time to type it. That doesn't mean anything, Darren. That it was printed doesn't mean anything. Yeah. 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 No, that's um, um Yeah, that's that's not true. That's it, 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 it no Darren, nobody is two hundred and thirteen years old. You know that. Hmm. Not even Nick Mars? Mm, he might be the exception, actually. Yeah, I thought. See, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, you know what? Take, I'm taking it back. Mick Mars right? might, Mick Mars might be older than Abraham Lincoln. I heard. I read on another Reddit page that Mick Mars sold Abraham Lincoln a a, a tiller, for, to, you know, for to be drawn by a horse, pulled by a horse. Like them. Hmm. That's still has the receipt. It's written on bark. <laughs> it's amazing that Mick Mars then would be the only human who rem- alive who remembers when Camp Town Races was a new song. He said he bought he bought the sheet music for it the uh, the year it came out. He ordered it earlier in the year, but you know it took forever for things to arrive. Mm-hmm. It's so funny he that he, and then he went on eighty plus years later to do the guitar part for Wild Side. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean he, he's he's a Renaissance man. He's he, he's what they call a, a, a true uh, three century man. <laughs> he's a true. He's a three century man. That's so. He, 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 he is. Yeah, yeah. Oh, hey, hey. Um, so now that you're so firmly ensconced out there in Weirdo Wood, you, you must have had some choice FT encounters, right? Do you mean like just running into people and stuff? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, there's people you get to, you get to, um, bump into and you get to, um, yeah, there, there's there's people around. Like who? You know, like I mean, I I don't know. I mean, I've run into uh, Nate Bargatze, uh, 
Aubrey Ooh. Plaza, um, Zach Cherry. You know, just di- different different comedians and and you know di- different people. Ooh. You know, yeah. I mean, just people like uh, Jordan Klepper. These are famous people? Yeah, these are all comedians. You'd, um, you'd tell me if you met Christy Brinkley, wouldn't you? Wait, w- would I tell you if I met Christy Brinkley? Yeah, yeah, yeah. no. I, well, I, wh- why? Well, I, I ask because sometimes it's... It's hard to trust you after that time we met Martin Short at the grand opening of the Newbridge Commons Footlocker Laughs, and you cornered him for like 15 straight minutes about that dumb movie you and your Legion of Dweebs love so much with that dumb line, I want to say Mason. Wait, say the... So the, annoying. What was the line again? I want to say Mason. Oh my good, this is a first... This is actually a first, Darren. I've been Darren, I've been doing this show for however many years I've been doing it and you this is the first time anyone calling in has ever gotten that line correctly. Really? And, and I've never seen that movie. You've never seen it and you got it right. Well, I don't know what wow. to say. That's a mind blower. Well, that is a yeah, uh all, all I know is that I was so mad because he, he was so delighted that you knew all that Clifford minutia, and, and he barely grunted, thanks, young lady, at me as he scrawled his name on my inner space DHS cover. It was really, I don't know, it made me feel bad. You know, those encounters are very difficult, and you don't know how they're going to go, and it, you can't put a whole lot of a weight on it because you don't know where they're going, honestly. I know, but I know I, I but you know, I, I should have tied my hair up, you know, because I, I, I just come from that photo session with my grunge band, the stank and my hair was especially silky and flowing that day. And I guess he thought he, he, he didn't really look at me. So I don't know. It's just, it was kind of embarrassing. Yeah. I, I wouldn't take it too hard, Darren. He's, he's meeting a lot of people. And if your hair looked particularly luxurious that day, then that's, how that goes, you know, that's. That was a good, that was a good era for me. God, you know, I wonder whatever happened to those cutoff shorts I wore inexplicably over white long underwear tucked into combat boots. You wonder whatever happened to those shorts. Yeah. And they were just like cut off. Great look. Like kind of oh, yeah. like really tattered denim. I'm assuming. Very. Very tattered, very tattered, and then you know, white long underwear on underneath those, and then uh, combat boots also, and then a big, uh, almost like a poncho kind of uh, Mm -hmm. pop. Yeah, some kind of look back then, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, but you know what? (laughs) I still can't believe I got kicked out of my own band after I said Pearl Jam painted themselves into a massive corner. With Vitology. Jeez. So I kept my mouth shut. Um, no, that's. Uh, th- wait, you, how, you got kicked. You said Pearl Jam painted themselves into a corner with Vitology. Into a massive corner. Yes. Uh, remember that, that interview I did for the New Bridge Music Connection cable access show? And then my after I said that, I, you would just feel the, my band members like inching away from me. Ugh. Oh yeah! The next no, day they told me that I was out. I was out. You were in a band with some pretty serious uh, uh, PJ heads. Oh, they loved it. Yeah, yeah. Ugh. I don't know. I, what can you do? You know. Uh, but, but you know, I had to look at it on the positive side because I'd have never met my first wife if the stank had gotten huge, and you know, though. That marriage ended with me tied up in the back of her grandfather's Chevy and left to die in the foothills of Mount Newbridge. It, it, it did give us our precious daughter, Cleopatra. Well, that's the blessing, Darren. Yeah. 
But I, I got to say, you told me 14 years ago that that name would lead to nothing but trouble, and boy, were you right. It's a lot of trouble? A lot of trouble? Total diva. Total diva. Mm-hmm. Like, oh my God, she she pretty much she pretty much runs the house. You know, she has a a list of chores I have to do when I get home from work, and she even makes me go to school for her. You go to school. I, I'm I'm confused now. Who's making you yeah, go to school? I go to um, Cleopatra, my uh, my stepdaughter. Your stepdaughter my makes daughter, you. Sorry, I, I, I my. Uh, well, I got three other stepdaughters, and they're all driving me nuts too. So sure, so you're yeah. just swimming in it right now. Your your head scr- your head scrambled. Up. Yeah, you're underwater. You're just buried yeah, so in the dirt. She makes me absolutely. She makes me go to school for her. And you go as your stepdaughter. I mean, daughter, daughter. Um, Sorry, I'm in it now. See, look. I know, right? It's a lot. To, it's a lot to remember. Um, um. No, I go I, I go as as myself, but you know she has this deal worked out with the principal, and so I hate it because I'm doing horribly in everything except gym, which is great because I dominate these kids on the court. I'm like white shack out there. <laughs> yeah, um, it, and I'm assuming you came up with that. You come up with that nickname. White Shack, absolutely, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. But you know, it's 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 so exhausting because I work and I go to school, and it's why I keep falling asleep at my desk at, at Consolidated. Mm-hmm. I'm averaging like forty five minutes of sleep a day. That's all you get because you're because po- you're burning get. the candle. Yeah, it's like REM sleep. I'm lucky if I get Miracle Legion sleep. That's sure. No, and and you would, I don't know what you would dream of if you were getting Miracle Legion sleep. Yeah, those might be nightmares. Or or some or some nice nice melodies. I don't know. Well, I guess or some nice stripped down music. To be fair, everybody likes different <laughs> things. Yeah. You know. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh. Hey, speaking of getting stripped down. Yeah, that's, that's. I can't wait to see where this goes. Probably the best segue you'll ever hear, right? Yeah, I, I, I. If this, if you land this segue, Darren, I'm gonna, uh-huh. I, I'm gonna buy you lunch. All right, all right. Did you hear about little Timmy Monroe? <laughs> wait, say that now. Did you hear about little Timmy Monroe? Did I hear about little Timmy Monroe? No. Yeah. Well, he's the son of Reggie Monroe, and needless to say, he's as garbage as everyone else in that cursed clan, right? That's a bad family. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, Timmy is 16, and he was on Catch a Predator the other night. Oh, no. But not for what you'd think. What was he on for? Right. So it's, you know, it's a typical thing. You know, this creepy guy comes, you know, to the, the bait house, you know, where, the, where he, he's been lured by the, uh, to catch a predator people, you know, the perverted justice uh, people, you know, mm-hmm. they've been chatting with this guy online and he's been creepy. So the guy's in the house, Chris Hansen is just about to come out, you know, and bust this perv. When who knocks on the door but Timmy Monroe? At the moment of 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 uh, of realization or triumph, however you want to describe yes. it. Yes, yes, Timmy was delivering a pizza. This perv ordered a pizza in advance. Can you believe that? Yeah, I guess I can believe that the per- pervs get hungry too. Oh, okay. I <laughs> But I mean, it's still a shocking protocol in the future. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Okay. Well, that's not necessary. I, um, I mean, I can believe it happened. It's bizarre beyond belief. And it's befit. It fits that family. That's true. Yeah. So, 
so Jimmy comes in with the pizza and he looks around the living room and he goes, Hey man, this house was vacant until yesterday and now there's all this foot traffic around it. It feels like a, a perv bait oh, house to me. Oh no. And then he starts doing this incredibly accurate and hilarious Chris Hansen impression. Oh God. To the to the perv. So, he goes, have a seat. Enjoying your pizza? Oh, my God. Want some soda? <laughs> Want some soda? Yeah. And then it gets here. He goes, he goes, what are you doing here? But then, but after every sentence he did as Chris Hansen, he'd make this really hilarious fart sound. <laughs> so, but the the truth of the matter is, the real Chris Hansen is behind a door, I'm assuming, me, mere feet but, away. But, yes, and but Kimmy doesn't know this. But then all of a sudden, one camera guy was laughing so hard he fell out of the broom closet and landed on his steady cam and broke it. Wow! So what did that do for this whole scenario? Well, so obviously Chris Hansen is furious. Not only that this kid was ripping him and doing it hilariously. But also that his own crew loved it. So he didn't put the footage in the final edit, but the footage got out. And from I, what I read in Biority magazine, the industry is going nuts over Timmy's irreverent charisma. That's, um, look, I, I think, look, it's not great to bust in an episode of To Catch a Predator, but. At least something positive is happening for somebody from that family, from the Monroe family. Oh, yeah. They, they say there's this big bidding war for his services going on between, um, who is it, um, Lauren Michaels, uh, Judd Appleton, and Sherwood Schwartz III. Sherwood Schwartz III. So that's the grandson of Sherwood Schwartz. Yes. Yeah, the creator of, like, the, the Brady Bunch and... Um, Stuff like that. Basically, Sherwood wants to build this new Gilgan's Island franchise around Timmy, and it's being reimagined by Trent L. Strauss, who said it's going to be a cross between the original Gilgan's Island and also his own movie, The Carcass Eaters. I mean, that sounds a little, um, maybe a little aggressive for what people would expect from a Gilligan's Island reboot. Oh, well, it's going to be on that new horror network, Shout Exsanguinate. I heard about that. Yeah, yeah. You know, you should um, you should see if you can get on the writing staff, you know, once they start hiring. Um, I, I don't think you're anywhere near ready to run a show yet, but you got to start somewhere, and maybe you could do runs out to, I don't know, Baja Fresh or cuckoo Roo or tommy's original chili for the actual creators of the show yeah no no I, I i see exactly where you're coming from darren that i'm nowhere near ready to be in any position of authority on an actual production but um boy i sure can make sure everybody's got their uh that they're nice and hydrated and uh that their tummies are full yeah would you say tummy again please tummy No, I still don't like it. No, I don't like it either. It's one of my least favorite words. Bad word. Terrible, terrible That's word. one of the bad ones. Um, oh, hey. I don't know if you heard, but um, my ex-mother-in-law, Gladys, um, has to have hip replacement surgery tomorrow morning. And um, Janine and Skyler, her son from her third marriage, are, are, are pretty concerned about Gladys's recovery. Mm -hmm. Really. Oh, well, I'm it's pretty heavy. Stuff. Sure. No. Well, look, I, I, I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that, and I, I hope everything works out for Gladys, your ex uh, mother in law. And you know, I guess just, uh, I don't know. Let me know if there's anything I can do. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Just let me know. Um. Well, there is one small thing you could help me with if, if, if you have a spare moment. I mean, it shouldn't, it, it's not a big deal. Okay. Hey, 
Okay, well, um, I need you to get on a plane, preferably tonight, and um, fly to Bismarck, North Dakota. And when you get there, I need you to rent a car and drive due north about 40 miles to a town called Baldwin. And uh, plug uh, 1453 Buffalo Run Lane into your um, GPS, and that'll get you there. And um, you're going to need to get your hands on a blowtorch to cut through the iron fence. Um, it's really thick, so it, it, it'll probably take a pretty good while. And um, make sure that you wear a welding mask because those things are hot. <laughs> Funny that. that reminds me of that great line from the Jerky Boys. That shit makes you itch. <laughs> Remember we, we used to laugh our buns off to that, and I, I still say very proud of you to, to, to people sometimes. So. I know you think that... that uh, Kamal wasn't as funny as, as uh, I think he was the funnier one. But anyway, so once you get in, you're going to need to serpentine through the backyard to avoid the motion detectors and, and the security cameras. And then um, you're going to need to jimmy the back door opening, uh, you know, with like a uh, like a hairpin or something like that. And um, so once you get in the house, you're going to need to turn off the security alarm. You're only going to have 10 seconds to do that or the cops are going to be called. So um, it's a pretty easy code to remember. It's um, star 28401893128432. I'm sorry. One, uh, uh, starting after that, sec- after that third three, uh, uh, 2947613 pound pound star. And once the alarm is, is, is unarmed, uh, make your way upstairs and go into the second room on the left. And underneath that bed is a suitcase. And basically, that's why you're there for the suitcase. And then, um, uh, da- 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 you Darren, are- Darren, I just got to stop you here and, and just ask what, what, what this insane plan that you just laid out for what any of this has to do with your ex mother in law getting hip replacement surgery oh well well the, the house in baldwin is where gladys is going to be recuperating starting tomorrow night from her surgery and the last time that janine and i went to visit gladys um like between me and me i um i met someone in bismarck um who sold me something very valuable that um will enable me to make a substantial profit when I um, I offload said items. Mm, okay. well, you're, you're being so you're being so cagey. What 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 what's in the box? Oh, no, seriously, don't don't worry about that. It, it's not a stash of that super creepy Eastern European ladies riding on tractors porn that I'm definitely not into. OK, <laughs> Although if I was, it's like God, God knows I'd, I'd be branded a perv for having that kind of, kind of stuff. And it's like, I guess I'm just tired of the double standard, you know, when it comes to that sort of thing. You know, it's like because gals are just as into that erotic stuff. You know, mark my words, 60 percent of these ladies have bulge bin files on their desktops titled tax junk. Serious. Uh, again, again. Just tell me what's in the box, please. All right, all right. You you squeeze it out of me like that last globule of crust toothpaste from the bottom of the tube. You, you still got a you still got a wacky packages line in there, huh? I do, do. I got like thirty of them in my in in, in my uh, comeback quiver. In your comeback quiver. Do you have a comeback quiver? Darren, what's in the box? You strapped in? Am I strapped in? Yes, I am. Got your your helmet on? I do have my helmet on. Got your fire retardant gloves on? Uh, Yes, I do. Great. Okay. It's 50,000 capsules of pharmaceutical grade blue. Okay. Right? Yeah. And and as we all know, Current Pharmaceuticals was forced to stop producing blue about 10 years ago because though it did cure 
rashes that also delivered a, a, a heroin-like high that turned people into zombified clowns who would do very silly, very embarrassing things. Like, I don't have to bring up what happened at, at, the, at, at that game where your brother Dom took some blue and he ran out onto the field while the rat men were playing and he somersaulted from the stands all the way to Gus Brennan in left field and he did that same awful sex simulation gesture that the guitar player from Super Chunk did to you on stage that night at Tramps. Oh, what an embarrassment. That was a true embarrassment. Horrible. That so was- anyway, this is the last of the current... This is the last of the Kern Blue, and all the rest of it was incinerated by the guy I bought it from. He, he was this Kern lawyer who supervised the recall and the destruction of the drugs when they were banned by the FDA. D- Darren, Darren, why do I have to do any of this? Like any of this? Because this is this is your scheme. This is all well, you. Because if I do it. If I do it, I'll get in big trouble. Oh, but it's okay if I get in trouble. Nobody's going to res- suspect you having done anything illicit because you're a famous rock and roll disc jockey. I'm a famous rock and roll. Well, that's news to me. I'm a famous rock and roll disc jockey. Uh, I knew I shouldn't have told you what was in the in the suitcase. I should have just, just told you it was something else in it and had you get it. To help your mother and ex ex mother in law. This had nothing to do with that, did it? No, I don't like her. But seriously, I, I said to you, if you need anything, if I can do it do do anything, you let me know. Which is me, basically. No offense, I'm being polite when you say that. Oh, you didn't really mean it? No, I meant it, but usually it means, at most, hey, can you go pick up a prescription at the pharmacy and help out? Not, well, can I get on a I'm... plane tonight? But, but, but what you'd be getting is something that that was prescribed at one point. Yes, it's, you were talking about blue, which is a highly addictive drug. And flammable, highly flammable. Highly flammable and addictive. Yes, yeah. And when I say, hey, anything I can do, let me know, to help out your ex-mother-in-law with her hip replacement surgery, not to help you go make some huge some huge drug score. Oh no. Oh no. What? Well, guess what they say about the best show being the preferred podcast of America's DEA agents is true. Just saw this this unmarked van pull up in front. Mm-hmm. They must have been they must have been listening to us talking about your sick drug scheme. You're trying to rope me into my sick drug scheme. Here we go. Okay, tell me about mo- yeah, more. Yeah, just... tell me more about my sick. I drug don't know scheme. anything. Ab- oh, I don't you... know anything about it. No, of course you don't. You I'm would know. At... No. How would you? I, I don't know. You're telling. All I know is what you told me, and I don't know how clearly I can say this. I will not be involved in this clearly illegal drug deal you're trying to pull off. Okay. Darren, it's good to know a, a leopard don't change its spots, and that's uh, good to know. It's proof of that right now. You're, All I know is you're going to be in huge, huge trouble when I start talking. Okay. Yeah. Oh man. Oh, I'm going to be. The I'm hunt. the one who's going to be in trouble, huh? Oh no. What? I forgot I have a flagrant hashish lab in my shed. Oh no. Maybe I can I can stuff some of it down the toilet. Okay, I gotta run. Oh man. Oh jeez. Oh man. Oh. 
Darren. Did we lose him? I think we lost him. Oh, uh, God bless him. Darren Ploppleton. Trying to loop me in on some stupid biz again. <sighs> Going to play a quick record, and then we'll be back with Ronald Bronstein. This is Car Seat Headrest. Hey, that was car seat headrest. How about that? With uh, 1937 State Park, which is from their album, Teens of Denial. Still such a great album. Six years later, still love it. Can't get enough. Love it, love it, love it. Uh, give me one second, and then we will get to the action because you know we used to play the song action anybody remember when i played that song anybody remember when the song action was a part of the best show anybody guess uh can remember who that song's by anyone no i sound like uh what's his face who do i sound like uh ben stein that bum what a bum that guy is what is he blaming? He was blaming something, like just straight up. It's amazing when these when these bums go from like lowercase r racists to just I'm ready to upgrade to capital R. I'm like, yeah, I'm ready to just go for it. Gross, right? Gross, everybody. It's gross. This world is sick and sad. And the best show is a place where you can watch a dream get crushed. Now with video, which is fun, uh, fun little addition to the uh, to the whole to the whole deal. Um, I'm looking for that. There we go. Now, my friends, welcome back to the best show. We're going to take one call, and then we're going to get to our our, uh, our celebrity guest. One call, then on to our celebrity guest. So hang tight, everybody. Hello, Best Show. Hi, Tom. Is this me? It is you. Who are you? Honored to speak with you. I am Listener C in Seattle, Washington. Listener C. So you're just the letter C. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. what I'm going with. Because I'm actually on a listener C food diet. Um, whenever I talk <laughs> to... <laughs> uh, what's going on, buddy? Well, just want to say quickly before I say what I want to say. This show's an institution. It's been there for me through so many different times of my life. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you for that. You know what, listener C? And first of all, drop the listener part of it. That creates a <laughs> class system that I don't enjoy. That's a WFMU thing, honestly. We'd be like, hi. Uh. There'd be people who call these shows on WFMU, the station I used to be on. Uh, be like, hi, I'm uh, this is uh, listener Bill. I want to just it's like like beating down listener, like saying that for it's like, yeah, of course you're a listener. You're listening. Maybe I'm caller C now. You're just, how about this? You're just C. There we go. So, um, always I drove me nuts about that. Uh, always drove me nuts about that WFMU class system there. And look, God bless WFMU. It gave me a million things in my life. Never would, uh, never would wish for anything other than what it, uh, anything but the best. For the station, but you know what? I never liked that vibe that the DJs would always dish out and be like, "We call them listeners." Hi, I'm listener Robbie. I uh, just wanna say, no, you're no better than the listeners, DJs. And look, I met all these DJs. They weren't that special. <laughs> Count on one hand the amount that were any worth their salt, and you got some fingers left over. So what do you got? C. Uh, 
So I have a story I wanted to share with you. That's uh, the best way I can describe it is if you combine your Mickey Dolan's experience with your Patty Smith experience and it's John Cale. Oh, I'm ready. Let's hear it. Wait, how is this on topic? Were so, you a child when this happened? Uh, I apologize for being off topic. That's my fault. Mm hmm. So to set the scene, um, it's like 2005 in New York City, and I'm in a rock and roll band with a bunch of very annoying people. What? Um, annoying people in a rock group? Yeah. Uh, to give you an idea of it, uh, two of them were male models, so that might give you an idea of their level of musicianship. Sure, sure. Um, Wait, hold on a second. I don't think that's very fair. You've never heard... Uh, <laughs> have you ever heard Marcus Schenkenberg play bass? Boom, 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 boom. No. He some, well, he wouldn't play the Seinfeld theme. That's uh be insulting to a bass player of Marcus Schenkenberg's capacity. He was like a Jocko Pastorius on steroids. And he was a male model? He still is. Once you got that face, wow. they don't take it away. Renaissance man. Yes, Renaissance man. Just like Mick Mars. So uh, <laughs> uh, so you're in a thing with John Cale. What happened? So, you're in a yeah, band. So, um, and you, you're in a rock and roll band. Huh. Well, he wasn't in the band. Yeah. That and, point, so it doesn't track. John no, Cale unfortunately. Was that would have been pretty cool. But, uh, through someone that we knew that's close to him. I won't say who it is because they don't know I'm telling this story. We get invited to this person's birthday party in the Chelsea Hotel. And this person says, hey, you should come to my birthday party. John Cale's going to be there. And so I'm like, well, that's pretty cool. I'll definitely go to that. Mm -hmm. um, so we get there and... They've kind of redone the Chelsea Hotel, like maybe in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And it kind of kind of was really weird in there. Like kind of the fixtures were really upsetting looking. Um, and we got up to the room and, and before we got up there, this person says he, he really hates cigarette smoking. So just don't smoke cigarettes around him. Mm -hmm. We're like, okay, we won't do that. And I'm thinking, wow. This is my chance to hang out with John Kill. I bet he's really gonna like me, you know. Got Go ahead. What? I heard a bass line. Go ahead, it's all yours. You got it. Um okay. the... never mind, you can't you look. <laughs> I'll say this. You're off topic. You gotta roll with what I throw at you, see. You're the one who did some fibber. Uh, I got no you, problem with that. You did some fibbing. You fibbed. What did I fib about? About being on topic. No, off topic. I, I freely admit to being off topic. Get off my phone. That's what I'm hanging up. I'm hanging up on you. You're gone. You're gone. Did I want to hear that John Kell story? Yeah, I did. But you know what? Rule of law is more important sometimes. No, it's not. I just really screwed myself on that one. I'm being told to go back to the phones. I'm being told to go back to the phones. Why? Famous person on the line. Because famous I'm told there's a famous person on the line. Person on the line. Here we go! This is an award-winning screenwriter, actor, uh, man about town, influencer, tastemaker, dare I say genius, mm -hmm. dare I say friend, Ronald Bronstein is on the show. How are you? Can I call you Ronnie today? Yeah. Of course I can. You know, you have to be fairly centered, I think, to survive that 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 audio tag, that famous person on the line tag. Brutal, Tom. 
it's it we're drawing lines here, Ronnie. Well, you know, it, it, it yeah, it, it puts each each famous person in the position to either out themselves as cocksure or mm-hmm. just you know find themselves riddled with 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 shame. Yeah, it's kind of on purpose. It's like a Rorschach test for the guest, mm-hmm. where they go. Oh, I guess I am a famous person. Thank you very much. Or they go no, famous that, that me. Certainly not my response. I, I'm more like um, like the world's most famous tetherball player or uh, <laughs> beat counter, something like that. Now, Ronnie, you're you. What you are is one of my favorite people. Uh-huh. And you know, you have a way. You have a way of you know putting up a, a bulwark the compliments i i've noticed over the years i don't think i've ever um addressed it before when you receive a compliment you have this sort of sort of a dollar store mantra you say that's sweet of you to say these are the things that you're supposed to keep to yourself when you figure out <laughs> the when you when you crack the little keys this is not a Nicolas Cage movie where the map is on the back of the Declaration of Independence. You're you're national treasuring me right now, Ronnie. These are the secrets that are supposed to stay secrets. Yeah, I'm I do. I go reeling that, your listeners in closer to you. What I say, Ronnie, is I say if somebody says a compliment, I go. Now the new one I say is oh, from your lips to God's ears, and then I just move mm. past it. I'm good at being I'm good at wow. being Sammy Maudlin, not uh William B. Williams. Well I only know I think fifty percent of those references. Well it's it's S E T V, you know Sammy Maudlin, remember? Oh of course. Remember the Sammy Maudlin show? Yeah. Yeah. Right. No, but <laughs> But yeah, Ron- it's funny because Mary and I were just gorging on SCTV. Mm-hmm. We, were, we actually were wondering why you have not had Andrea Martin on the show. I would Something love. We going to bring up. I would love nothing more. This is who I would love to have on the show. I'd love to have Joe Flaherty and Andrea Martin on the show. Those would be the two people from SCTV that I would love to speak to more than anyone else. They were my two heroes, along with John Candy, the late great John Candy. After that, Tony yeah. Rosado, maybe Robin Duke, um, the Jules Hallmeyer dancers we could have on. We'll slide down the list a little bit, but Ronnie, enough with SCTV talk. We're here to talk about you because for people who don't know, probably every- so. what's that? Mm-hmm. No, no, it's just probably why I seem a little reserved, right? Don't worry, you don't worry. You were gonna, you're gonna be spilling your guts like a bleeping slot machine when all the uh, that's, bells that's and whistles like start. More in my wheelhouse. But. Yeah, you. Everybody knows the names, the Safety Brothers. Good time, uncut jams. Daddy Long Legs, the heroin one that I'm blanking on this second. Heaven knows what. Heaven knows what. But what some people, they see Josh Safty, Benny Safty, And that, but what they, what a lot of people don't realize, oh, there's not two. There's three. And there's a guy named Ronald Bronstein. He co-writes all right. those movies. He co-edits all those movies. Right there. Co-genius. Under the hood. Under the hood. Under the hood. <laughs> if if the Safty brothers, if Josh and Benny are the guys selling the if if Josh is selling the car and Benny's the guy who pitches you the service plan. 
<laughs> Ronnie's the guy you sit down and you got to work out that finance contract with that you didn't know you were going to go see, but he's there and the whole thing doesn't run without him. You know, I, I guess that's a natural segue to discussing Frowland because <laughs> if you want to understand why my natural place, my natural resting place is under the hood, then you only need to sort of scratch your little fingernail you mm-hmm. know, into the back of that Blu-ray. This, because you made a movie before you worked with the Safties, you made, you wrote and directed a movie called Frownland in 2000. It came out in 2007, but you worked on it for literally six years before that. Six. That's right. Six. Yeah. It's not. I do not recommend um, anybody mooring themselves to uh, to any sort of circumscribed set of ideas for for six years of time. Well, I'm going to say it's like. Uh, it's like being chained, you know, it's, it's like being chained to one of those sort of modernist 60s revolving restaurants mm-hmm. <laughs> where it just keeps spinning around. <laughs> and you got to wait for it to loop back around. Uh-huh. But I'm going to say this. The exception to the rule of what you just said is the movie you made. Because you proved that maybe... If you can make a movie as good as Frownland, then maybe spending six years on a movie is the way to go. Uh, You know, I think your role here will be to help sell copies. And my contributions will lead to demands for refunds. (laughs) And hopefully we'll just land in some kind of zero sum. Well, I'm going to say this. First of all, there are no refunds. If you buy Frownland, when you buy Frownland, I am issuing a decree that trumps any store policy. No refunds. You buy a copy at Barnes and Nobles, as my mother would say. Don't know why she adds S's to these things. Why does she add S's? to? I do the same thing. She says Barnes and Nobles. It's not a second. I do. She'll add w- letters into the thing. You know, you know the convenience store chain Krausers? No. Well, it's a new it might be more of a New Jersey thing. She'll say Krausners. There's no N in there. Krausners. No. <laughs> Barnes and Nobles, Krausners. And then she'll always go, You ever see that? What's that guy on that show with the Blue Bloods? What's the guy on Blue Bloods? I don't know. Blue Bloods? It's been one of these stealth shows that's been on for 15 years. (laughs) And and nobody Mm. you know or I know has ever seen it who isn't a grandparent. So I think the last time I watched a show like that, I don't uh, I don't even know the name of it. It was this it was the the cop show had a redhead. I think the the big I think it showed it showed his 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 uh I think his his bare ass was was shown on on broadcast television. That was it. N- that sounds you know like NYPD about? Blue. Mm, yeah, that might be it. And Dennis Franz. I checked in. Dennis Franz <laughs> gave one for the ladies, a treat for the ladies. Um. So, but seriously, no. You go buy. Frownland, no refunds. You have to pass it on to a different person who maybe will get it. That's the best show law. If you get the Blu-ray for this and you're just like, I don't know. I don't know what to make of that. Pass it on. Don't go. You can't. Well, first of all, you opened it. So you can't get your money back anyway. What what kind of weirdo are you going? I'd like to bring this back. Uh, yeah, I opened it. Because I tell you, you buy a Criterion. They got that sticker on there with the director's uh, signature. Are we going to tape that back on? No, you're out of luck. But I'm saying right now, Frownland, the movie you wrote and directed, is a towering achievement to me of, it's. I think it's hilarious without being funny, if that makes sense. 
Does that make any sense? It, it, you know, look, I certainly think the movie is funny. You know, I, I, I think most of the time making it, you know, uh, me and the four other people that made this movie, five other people, you know, we were, we, we really thought we were making, you would think that we were, ma- we were making some kind of slapstick kabuki theater, you know, mm-hmm. but uh, somehow what seemed to be communicated to others who did not make this movie once it premiered was just abject anxiety. And, uh, oh boy, I was not, pre- I was not prepared for that. I'll tell you that. You were not prepared for the degree that this movie would stress people out, freak people out when they, when they sat no. down and watched it. No, no, you know, I, uh, it's hard for me to, you know, whatever, articulate what my primary purpose was in making this movie. But, uh, you know, like I had a particularly wretched run in my, in my twenties and, uh, I more or less blamed, you know, Woody Allen for it. Um, you know, I had, I had kind of internalized his way of using or abusing, uh, funny self-deprecation, right. Mm-hmm. As a kind of a uh, social glue or, you know, uh, I, I, I internalized that into my personality you know, uh, to such a staggering and self-defeating degree <laughs> without ever realizing that, you know, his self-deprecation was, was propped up on, on fame and success. He could afford to be self-deprecating. You know, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was charming in the context with which he applied it. But when I applied it, you know, I was just <laughs> forfeiting my place well, in the mating pool. I got so upset. I wanted to show what uh, self-loathing and and self-deprecation, like how self-effacement actually played out in the context of real life social interaction. So you've, you know, to me, it was a very funny thing to show, but I think we just went so far, so far into like externalizing insecurity. It is. The the movie is a testament to insecurity, Ronnie. The movie is a Uh testament to seething, to insecurity, and how insecurity becomes a seething, passive-aggressive rage that powerless people don't know where to put it. So they take it out on each other, and they hope that they are one inch above the person, above somebody who is more or less equal to them, so they can look down on them in that given moment. And yeah, but I, I, I don't blame someone for that either. You know, it's, it's certainly like, you know, uh, the main character of the movie doesn't, he doesn't have a mean bone in his body, but he also has literally seemingly nothing to offer anyone, you know? So I, I don't begrudge anyone from wanting to just like shoo him away. Yeah. He... There's, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a kind of meanness to it. I guess that's where the humor comes from. There's a kind of meanness to it that I, that I like deeply relate to. So maybe that's what's so confusing about it and why it got people so upset. You know, you kind of couldn't figure out exactly who you should be uh, uh, commiserating with. The thing with the movie is when I first saw the movie, it struck me as the kind of movie where it's like, oh, if you like comedies, it's like, oh, it's almost like you were hearing people say, oh, you, you like movies starring lovable losers. You like movies starring, uh, nebbishes that that you just gotta root for even though they can't get out of their own way you were and it it felt like you were saying oh yeah well see what i'm gonna show you this guy named keith Mm -hmm. and the countdown clock has begun and you hit this buzzer when you finally can't take this guy anymore and want to murder him (sighs) Yeah, that that sounds accurate. Because um, it, it it's you know, it, it, it it you speaking play with the, movies, the elements of that of those movies. Speaking of movies with, with of of like you know whatever lovable nebbishes, which again I always found so irritating. Um, there's that movie Sideways, right, with Paul Giamatti. He seems to he seems to have played a few of those roles, right? And uh, I remember one time I was uh, I got out of work earlier than I anticipated, and. Uh, 
kind of great. I, I, uh, I, I, I ran to this comic book store for a signing. And when I got there, it was packed. I could barely fit into the place. Somebody was giving a lecture. And right at the, at the base of the front door, there was just like a, 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 a there was like a, what was it? It was, it was just a, there was a whole like barrel full of beer bottles. Right. And, uh, mm-hmm. and I looked behind me, there was a guy kind of like, right. I was standing right in the doorway. There was a guy kind of like elbowing at me and I can see he was trying to kind of reach in without going into the shop <laughs> and grab one of these beer bottles for free. And, uh, and I look and it's, it's, uh, I'm like kind of, I'm not turning around. I'm not noticing who it is, but, uh, but I don't want to give him the satisfaction of making room for him. And I, I kind of, Turn my head and I realized it's Paul Giamatti, right? Uh-huh. And uh, and yeah. I, I just decided to make it more difficult for him to enter, enter the store. And he slips, and his entire <laughs> arm slips into this barrel full of, of beer bottles and just gets submerged <laughs> all the way up to the elbow, like a full button-down sleeve shirt. Anyway, and I gotta just say, Giamatti, you had it coming. You go in the store like well, a that was, get... come up in for, that was his come up in for tricking people yeah. who don't like themselves into thinking that life would be easier for them than it actually is. Now, Frownland is I've seen Frownland, I think, five times now. I watched it today. I rewatched it today. And it is it it just gets more and more Very fascinating funny. for me. It's I cannot there's different spots where I there's spots where I find myself laughing where I didn't laugh before, where maybe I felt like, oh no. And then this time I watch it and I laugh. And then there's other spots where I'm like, wait, last time I watched this, I was laughing at that. Now I think it's making me sad this moment. Like when he Ugh. goes to the vi- when he goes at the there's a scene where Keith and I'm gonna say this if there was any justice in the world Ronnie Bronstein this October now this is on Criterion you'd you'd your doorbell would ring trick or treat you'd look out you'd see six kids wearing <laughs> striped shirts because <laughs> Keith's shirt is is a- iconic. I'm telling you, oh, uh, man, you know, uh, I realized Gene early, Hackman's trench coat, early. Gene Hackman's trench coat, uh, 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 Burt Lancaster's glasses in sweet smell of success. Keith's shirt. These are the, this is what I would have in my museum of film yeah. history. It's, it's got those two frayed holes in the back <laughs> for, you know, the, <laughs> where the tag uh, in the back of the shirt has been removed. <laughs> and I'm going to guess there was one of those shirts, right? I want right? to tell you something about this shirt. I want to tell you something about this shirt because it, it uh, just uh, approaching the movie from a, uh, a formal perspective, you know, I really realized fairly early on while making it that, uh, that I wanted to have latitude when I was editing and, uh, uh, and that would be impossible if I was constantly changing his wardrobe. And I just realized, you know, no one's going to notice. I'll just make him wear the same thing every day. Mm-hmm. And then when I get into post, right, I'll just be able to reconfigure this movie any way I want, backwards yes. and forwards, up and down. And, uh, uh, you know, I said, if it's good enough for Charlie Brown, it's good enough for Keith. And, uh, and it did, it ended up becoming incredibly valuable because I, I really said the original cut of this movie was like four and a half hours long. And oh. it, it just took me such a long time to figure out, you know, how to remove everything that was embarrassing to me. Mm-hmm. And that shirt, you know, just giving him a uniform proved to be the key to, uh, to at least my success. And then I, I, I brought that same idea over to Daddy Longlegs. You know, I just insisted that Lenny will wear the same thing every day. And the same thing happened. And when we started editing the movie, that's what sort of, uh, that's what saved it. And now when you mentioned Daddy Longlegs, that is the movie, that that is the first uh, team up with Josh and Benny that you that's did. Right. But that's you right. were on this 
in a unique position. You were co-writer, right? Well, mm, what happened was, you know, look, these two guys, much younger than me, 10 years younger than me, uh, you know, saw Frowland and, uh, and just sort of tracked me down. I, for anyone who I'm assuming most of the people listening right now don't know Frowland, but I'm not in it. I don't act in it. I had no intention of being an actor. I don't, I, I, I shave with the light almost completely out. I don't like to look at myself in the mirror. I, I, I give myself haircuts for my entire adult life because the thought of sitting in front of a mirror, um, you know, for upwards of 45 minutes just gives me anxiety. So having said that, they track me down and they insist that I have to play their father in a movie. And, um, you know, it didn't make any sense. Uh, I certainly didn't have, uh, had not displayed any of the skill sets required to, 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 you know, take on that mm-hmm. responsibility. So them coming but, to you and saying, uh, we want you to so star persistent. in our movie. They said, you, oh, Ronnie Bronstein, yeah. we want to work with you in an, as an actor. And you're just, I was, I was uh, projecting at, at the museum of the moving image. I was projections at the time. And, and, and Josh just waited for me outside the theater and just, you know, I wouldn't say he harassed me, but he was very, very persistent. He just has such a winning personality that ultimately, you know, people, you run into people sometimes and they see your best image of yourself, right? They see you in that light Mm -hmm. and, and who wants to argue with that, you know? So it wasn't my decision to do it was, I guess, counterphobic, right? It wasn't that I wanted to do it, but I didn't want to be the kind of person who was too, you know, afraid to do it. And it was, I'm telling you, it just, it was my, it, it saved my life, that experience, because I was so demoralized and dejected after six years on, on Frowland that I, I had no sense of having acquired a skill set at all. Mm-hmm. You know, it was, it was, um, I had just barely slithered over the finish line. And if I were to tell you about like some of these early screens and the premieres, they were not, they did not lift, they did not buoy my spirit, you know? So, so you, you were screening Frownland and what would a, what would a typical screening of Frownland, uh, how would it go? Well, I will, t- I'll, I'll tell you the first screening of Frownland. Um, so, you know, I never actually like, I never felt a sense of, of completion. You know, I stopped, the movie was finished simply because I couldn't think of anything else to do with it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, and one day I was walking around uh, and I saw an advertisement, a flyer for the uh, first annual Williamsburg Film Festival. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I called the number immediately. I asked them if they were taking movies. And the lady who answered the phone just accepted Frowland right there on the phone, which was... Uh, you know, generally not how film festivals work <laughs> where you don't, no, you don't no. make a call and go, Hey, can my movie be in your film festival? And they go, the, usually what they would say is, well, we're going to need to see it first. <laughs> I, we made me and the, and my partners on this, we worked in a complete hermetically sealed vacuum. We were in our minds. We were the only people making a movie on earth. And we had no connection to other filmmakers. We had no connection to festivals. We had no collect connection to, there was never even a thought that we were going to send this thing to Sundance. We just assumed that if anyone was going to see this, because we rented a theater ourselves. So, uh, so I didn't like, you know, I, I, it, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to like preserve like the virgin cherry of a premiere, which is like a thing. It's like a careerist thing that, that filmmakers think about when they approach where they want to position them. None of that stuff enters my mind at all, not even a little bit. So this, this so the next thing I know, I'm going to, all right, I'm going to premiere at the first annual Williamsburg Film Festival. So Mary um, and myself go up, and I knew well enough not to tell the other people that I, I that had worked on the movie. It, it, there was something shameful about it, right? Yeah. Now, Mary, um, so for we, people who don't know, Mary I, is, Mary is oh, your wife who... She's my wife, and she's, she's in Frownland, and she's... You know, she's she's the best writer. On no, Earth. Mary's so, a better writer than no all of us put together. That's right. That's right. That's a hundred percent true. And uh, uh, 
Yeah, and it doesn't cause her the levels of stress that it causes me or Josh or any of us. It just seems to pour right out of her. But nonetheless, um, we showed up at this warehouse, which again, if if you know, if saying warehouse in Williamsburg mm-hmm. implies like some kind of cool cachet, that this was more like a dirty cellar, and uh, nobody was there. There was literally nobody there. There was like a few cushions on the floor. There was a DVD player hooked up to a very, very, you know, um, <laughs> primitive video projector. And I got there like shortly before Frowland was supposed to start. And on screen, there was, uh, <laughs> there was this incredibly amateurish, um, homemade <laughs> documentary um, that chronicled the filmmakers, the death of the filmmaker's grandfather. And it was just these like mournful shots of like poorly framed shots of this very old man sneezing <laughs> and coming in and out of consciousness. <laughs> and uh, and, this is and your... nobody was there. Even the filmmaker wasn't there. And, and just the, <laughs> yeah, the labored sound of this guy's breathing was just like <laughs> the backdrop for, you know. <laughs> really? Set on the table all, for everybody yeah, to have a party with Frownland. Yeah, anyway, so, so then um, two skaters showed up. These two teenage skaters showed up, and they just sat on their skateboards on the floor just in time for Frownland to begin. And then the movie starts, and I would say within about five minutes, I just, you know, I, I look over to see if they had any kind of reaction. And it's really terrible. There's no reason to ever be at a screening of something that you've made, ever. And what are you going to do, like stare at the back of people's necks? I mean, unless you've made a horror movie where people are gasping or you've made ah, whatever, there was no, it, my point is it would be a fool's errand for me to be looking for external signs that the movie was working. But nonetheless, that's what I did. And, and, and these, these, these kids were just staring into their flip phones. They were just lit up completely blue. And after about maybe eight or nine minutes, they, they stood up and they skated out of, of the warehouse like on wheels they rolled out they didn't walk out and then walking's mary, not fast enough mary started, yeah mary started to laugh and really you know i mean she was she was she was laughing only because the experience was so in step with our with our understanding of the universe yeah and the uh, and the movie I, I, I screamed at her. I screamed at her. It's the most embarrassing, like the rawest, corniest thing that's ever come out of my mouth. I screamed, uh, this is my life's work. <laughs> and I, it, it just resounded through this empty theater. That was it. That was it. I don't even think the movie played all the way through because at some point there was no reason. Nobody was there. Nobody was showing up. So that was the premiere of the movie. Um, <laughs> it, <laughs> oh, oh, Ronnie. <laughs> um, I... It's okay. It's okay. You know, I'm fine. I survived it. You know what I learned early on is that, and again, look, the movie ended up, you know, receiving, you know, lots of approbation, you know, from very rarefied corners of the uh, movie going public. Right. Mm -hmm. So I I can't complain, but I did learn fairly early that if you, uh, if you, if you, if you allow yourself to internalize approbation from total strangers, you are, you are intrinsically obligated to, uh, to internalize disapprobation from other strangers. So you just better to just ignore all of it, you know, and then you just kind of, you, you kind of, unfortunately, then nothing external is going to make you feel too good, but then nothing's going to make you feel lousy either. Yeah. Then it's on you to create your own, moments to feel your own feel good moments because you're not Uh letting anything in. And then you Um, get to be a Paul Simon. Then you're like, I am a rock. Then that song is about you. Right. (laughs) I have frown land. I I build my walls and I project frown land onto them. Um, I, it brought me great joy to learn about your, uh, your, I guess, failed Paul Zyman video idea. That's in the book, right? It's in the book, Ronnie. 
And did you hear what happened at the I beginning of the book. show tonight, Ronnie, by any chance? No. Peyton Reed came by to say hello in studio and then to literally tell me on the air that the scene I was going to shoot for Ant-Man 3 has been canceled. That he well, just he told uh, me I'm on the air, Ronnie. Well, Tom, I, I'm going to tell you on the air, all right? And this is uh, this might be your comeuppance for pairing me with a successful filmmaker. But it looks like you might be ending up on the cutting room floor on the voice work that you did for my animation project. So there you go. It all comes full circle. Hold on a second. I did some voice work on an animated thing Ronnie's been doing a few months ago. And oh, wait, this is scoop. Isn't this supposed to be the scoop? We'll Hold... wait on that. Oh no, no, you were supposed to save. You're supposed to wait. It's supposed to be a fun moment where I go, <laughs> give us a scoop, Ronnie, and you go, Oh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> we're working on a, a yeah. t shirt. Look, I I would not have mentioned it, and it's not definitive yet. Um uh, and it was no fault of your own performance wise, but I said baited into mentioning it just simply because you're a chose to bring another filmmaker on the show tonight. So this is like some old Testament the, stuff. The then you're, this is like old Testament retribution that I, I, I wor I worshipped. I don't another know God. I don't know the New Testament. Wait, that's not old. <laughs> Hold on. So I guess um, I should just let me just. I'm Come sorry, on, let, let give us a scoop. Question. There you go. Come on, give us a scoop. Okay. I got cut from the animated thing, too. Anything else? Um, Anybody else want to... Uh, but like, any other shattered dreams that can be shattered tonight? Any Anything else? Uh, Forever Dog really kicking me out? <laughs> Wait, say that again? Is this really the moment that you played the scoop audio tag? Oh, no, I thought that was the scoop. I thought that was the scoop that I got cut out of the animated thing as well. I just thought, you know, um, since you were already, you know, sort of suffering from bad news tonight. <laughs> you So you <laughs> thought you'd slip that one through to be just like... Like, that's yeah, like dropping... A, that's like a, when they drop news on like a Friday night. Because they know that nobody watches the news on the weekend. Oh. No, it's more like when you know something bad is happening to you, but in the moment, that part of real estate in your brain is already working on um, reshaping it into an anecdote to entertain others, right? That's sort of what you've done with mm -hmm. um, all of the whole cutting room floor motif. So I'm just, I'm, I'm just playing along, man. Cut. What you would call me? I should be like that. New theme for the show is Scissor Man by XTC because I'm getting cut left and right. Snipping, snipping, snipping. I'm the Scissor Man. Cutting me out of every show. Oh, man. Got you cut out. Are, uh, you really have a very clear jumping off point with XTC, right? Oh, I have a very clear jumping off point, and it gets. It's uh, Black Sea, I think, is my jumping off point. Um, remember, I've moved it uh, up a little bit. I think it was the, uh, I used to have that trouser press guide and it described oranges and lemons as the, 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 uh, Steely Dan playing the Beatles songbook. I, I really, I, I care for oranges and lemons, but I understand why you don't. It makes sense. It sounds like it's, it sounds like it's like rubbery to me. It sounds rubbery. And I thought they did a better version of that on Dukes of the Stratosphere anyway. And then they did. There we go. Okay. There's the graphic, at least. Breaking news. Tom cut from two projects live on air. <laughs> there's a graphic now. <clears throat> and then I hear Dudio um, roaring with laughter in the background. Uh, he literally went like sorry. this. <laughs> Oh, just, look, this is frown just somebody to, just I said in the chat, audience. this is Tom's frown land. I'm in frown land now. 
This is my friend. I, I am Keith. Audience, wait, wait. A little context. I want the audience to know that this was just an animation test, right? This was sure. not something that was being made for broadcast, mm -hmm. right? This, uh, but it's to scale. I mean, you know, huh. well, me in relation to Peyton Reed. Sure, no, no. Is being cut from Ant Man in sure. relation to being cut from mm -hmm. a, a 90 second animation test. No, no, that's fair. It's all fair. No, that actually makes it sound nice. <laughs> yeah, you didn't want to be in it anyway. Oh, um, I didn't want to be so, in that dumb so, show anyway. So, that dumb animated I show that... I don't, I don't blame you. Um, anyway, whatever. I, I, I feel like I've, it, I would say I could pick up the threads where I was, mm -hmm. which was I just went such a scenic route simply to say that by the time I got to the end of Frowland, I felt like I had no connection to uh, my own, uh, the skill sets I had acquired. And then Josh and Benny showed up and, and they certainly seemed to see it. And I didn't want to tell them they were wrong. Mm -hmm. And that experience was, you know, I ended up, be, you know, I ended up working on the writing side of it simply because I was so self-conscious that I said to them, if I'm going to do this, I have to have some control over what comes out of my mouth. Yeah. And, and then, so, you know, they agreed to that. They were very agreeable. We all got along so well. And that whole experience making that movie is like, I mean, it's like when you're, when you're, a, when you're a little kid and you're asleep in the back of your parents' car mm -hmm. and you're maybe kind of drifting in and out of consciousness. And it's just like this pure relaxation. Like you have no, you don't have any worry or anxiety over the directions, navigation, the driving of this vehicle. And you can kind of feel the car moving. You can kind of feel and sense when it's come off of the highway because now it's making more left and more right. Like, I don't know, is that something you relate to? Yeah, no, I, I remember just being in the back of my, uh, in the back of a car with my grandparents and just being like, and then just being like, I just want to, not be here or i don't want to be at their house either can we just go back to normal stuff can my parents get back to back here and take me home again like the nirvana song i was living the nirvana song now i'm living Frownland. i was living that grandma take me home grandma take me home i was living that now i'm I, i'm one striped shirt go get come here go get me a striped shirt with two holes in the back i might as well just be go full keith now well, you know, maybe I'll send you a few more comps. Send me a few more a what? Comps, free copies. Oh, okay, sure. No, um, no. Look, I I love anyway, it. I, I I was very peaceful to not have to be in control to not have to be in control mm -hmm. of other people's feelings and yeah. and, and, and emotions. You know, uh, when you're making a movie and nobody's getting paid. Mm -hmm. You know, like money is the cheapest currency that there is. You know, if you can't afford to pay people, then you're paying them in some sort of on some sort of existential currency. Yeah. And uh, and oh, doing that over six required so much uh, uh, manipulation, manip real manipulation to keep people engaged and keep people excited and to make people think that it was in their best self interest to engage that uh, to, to not have any of those responsibilities and only to be able to exist inside of this world that Josh and Benny were creating was just uh, uh, like, that was the thing that, that has allowed me to continue working at all in movies. Yeah. And, and it's, then, you know, it looks, whatever, I, I, I'll say this, Ronnie, nobody yeah. you've gone. You've one of the, one of the things I love about you is you have a code and you have lived by the code and the code does not always make it easy, but that's the price of having a code that you live by. But you have a code. I, and, but the code now, when I see you suddenly, oh, here comes good time. Oh, it's starting to get heat. Everybody's talking about it. Then suddenly... Uncut gems, 
It's like a 5,000 pound weight dropped on everybody's head. And it just, that to me, it was just well-deserved for all three of you. You know, can I, can I mention about, you know, the first time that, that, that you and I met was to show you uh, ostensibly it was, it was, I guess it was, it wasn't a rough cut because the picture was locked, but the sound had not been locked. It was an unmixed sort of muddy, um, uh, uh, audio experience, but it was more or less the uncut gems that came out in theaters, you know, later that year. But I, I wrote you and I invited you up to our office and you met Josh and myself mm-hmm. and we maybe spoke for all of two or three minutes and we sat you down in a chair and we showed you the movie and we left and then we watched you on our, let me just, well, let me just explain my side <laughs> of things first. I go to the office, beautiful office. And it's going to be a screening for one. There's a chair set up in front of the biggest screen, the biggest flat screen TV I've ever seen. <laughs> Sounds booming. There's It's one chair and a remote and the TV. And and you, you and Josh, and Benny was there for the beginning. Benny had the split, saw everybody. But then you and Josh say, hey, we're going to go have a working dinner. We'll be back when the movie's over. So I sit down, You then Josh starts the thing, the two of you leave, I'm alone in your offices, I'm sitting right there, right next to the masks from Good Time from the bank robbery, didn't touch them, didn't wear them, didn't do anything, was I tempted? A little bit. Did I do anything? I didn't. So I watch the movie sitting in the chair, movie ends, my brain is exploded from Uncut Gems, knowing zilch about it at that point. Then, oh, Ronnie and Josh walk in as the movie ends to, to the second. Yeah, time perfectly. Wow, how'd they time that? <laughs> Which I found out months later, well, they timed it because they were watching me the whole time. And then I get yeah. dropped <laughs> then a year later, you send me a picture that basically looks like a security cam cam photo of me in a chair watching Uncut Gems. And I said to my, when I saw that picture. Can you please use that picture for something in promotion of the best show? Can that be your like kind of default avatar? I have that picture on my desktop. <laughs> Is, wow. Should we, can I release it to the public? Say certainly the, can. Okay, I'm going to do it right to now. To the public? I assume not. Right now. Here we go. Hold on. I'm going to look at it to make sure I don't look stupid. I don't look stupid. I'm sitting respectfully in a chair watching a TV screen. I'm sending it. Jason, I'm, I'm putting it in your text. I did it already. Sorry. Can you forward it? The picture of me watching on here. Come on, give us a scoop. There we go. Please give us a scoop. And now here's the new one. Baby wants a scoop. (laughs) So I guess we have our scoop. All right. The picture is now. Um, I, I, you want, no, no, I can be more, I can, I can put a more positive. I mean, I just want to say this from that experience. There's not a week that goes by, not a day. I'm past it. I'm past the day part of it. Then now the picture is out there for the world to see. There's me sitting in a chair watching Uncut Gems in the office, not knowing I'm being watched. Low res security cameras. Um, I not a week goes by. I'm past the daily part of it being a concern, Ronnie. Now we've got we've reduced it to a week. Me and my therapist have reduced it to a week goes by that i don't say literally thank christ i didn't do something stupid in that office (laughs) it did that you know what it's funny until tonight that did not occur to me i never once sort of entered your side of it consciousness wise i'm just i just I look great. We were watching. You were like a guinea pig. We wanted to see your reaction. You know, we were. We we just had an opportunity to watch you 
react to our work. From, in, a, in a, from a basic sense, fact. I'll say this. You didn't know me that well. You only knew me over the radio. You don't know if I got some some thing where I got to steal. You don't know if I just, if that's my thing. And True. It's not a, so you got to check the security it's camera it's every once in a while. Make sure I'm not grabbing stuff. I wouldn't blame you. Maybe yeah, not that, watch that, me. That, that I can assure you that that literally did not even enter into my mind as possibility until this very moment. That's crazy. Well, that was that's a testament to the trust that you've built over 20 years. Well, that pi- into a microphone. look at that picture. Now everybody can see me watching uncut gems months before it's this is all it's this, this is where I'm at now. I just have to lean into I saw it months before the rest of you did <laughs> like, like I'm trying to find anything that gives me some sort of high ground. And now as my, I'm turning it. I'm heading towards Howard Howard territory now. I'm half Keith, half Howard. <laughs> I'm in free fall right now. Lost Ant Man <laughs> three. Lost the cartoon. The video of me is, is watching a thing secretly watching me. Yeah, I yeah. don't know. You know, uh, I I did not force myself onto the show. You did not. No, I asked you to come on, Ronnie. And let me just ask you this. Now, it just you acted in Daddy Long Legs. You, you, and both of these movies, by the way, came out on the Criterion Collection last week, I believe. And that's a huge, it's a huge, it's a huge deal, especially for Frownland. I feel like that's a validating moment that you can say we we did it. You can now say that they don't just, you don't, you don't win a contest to get a criterion, uh, disc issued. There is a standard. That's literally why it's called. That's why it's the criterion. It's, um, so congratulations on that. It is a big deal. And if you, whether you see it that way or not, everybody who loves criterion, uh, collection sees it that way. And it's a huge deal. So that's exciting. But Daddy Long Legs, you acted in, you have, correct me if I'm wrong, you've never acted since. No. What happened was, you know, I, I had, you did, uh, I had no, you know, if I really didn't have, you know, Josh and Benny and myself had, you know, we had a, a process and a method and they knew exactly how to throw stimuli at me in just the right ways to overcome my self-consciousness and get whatever they wanted out of me. But I do not have the skill to, you know, uh, look at text on a page and sort of heat it up, bring it into my brain and shoot it back out of my mouth mm-hmm. in a way that, uh, that is alive. I have no, I wouldn't know the first thing about how to do that. And although, you know, once the movie came out, uh, there was enough noise around it. So, you know, it's like, you know, well, you won an award. You won, you literally won an acting award. Oh yeah. Award. I forgot about that. I literally forgot about that. Tell, I tell did, us the, about uh, this acting did, award and how that night went, please. Eh. I, I, I'll tell you what, I, I, I also went out to the Spirit Awards, and, uh, and I didn't win that. So that's the one I, re- I remember. And I don't, it doesn't like, it didn't cause me pain. It was more, you know, I was, it was the Spirit Awards. I was up against, I was the only sort of uh, unknown entity in my category. I think I was up against James Franco and Ben Stiller, and I can't even remember who else it was, but they were all, you know, like uh, famous people. And mm-hmm. I was, the only one that was unknown in the spirit awards contacted me and they told me, you know, they wanted to write a skit. Would I, would I, would I appear in a skit, some sort of interstitial skit Mm -hmm. during the broadcast? And they sent me the material. And aside from it just being horribly unfunny, like it was just (laughs) all these jokes at my expense, you know, just making huge, making like a, it was really funny to the spirit awards that nobody knew who I was. Yeah. 
And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't that I wasn't able to like joke about it. I don't have some, I, I could use the, you know, it wasn't like my ego was bruised by that. It just, I just thought, oh, wow, that's sort of all the, the whatever the, the it, values of the spirit awards are kind of out of whack. Yeah. Because that's, they're, you know? they're operating on a fame based currency. Yeah, it felt that way a little bit. And, and really, though, really, though, you know, I, I, I get very conflicted with those things because on one hand, I want to be the kind of person that doesn't care at all. I don't care. I'll glide into these things. It means nothing to me, win or lose. And that's like that's definitely like like a it's not a that's not phony when I when I when I assert that. But at the same time, uh, uh, I'm a very self-conscious person. So anytime I put myself in a in a position to be. Uh, just like publicly scrutinized, my brain just goes into, it just stops functioning properly. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and therefore, so there's always a kind of tension in me whenever I, I do anything, which is, again, why I like being under the hood. I just, I know myself. I know myself. I yeah. can think of, you know. But now, but now for the anyway, Gotham Awards, uh, you had so a I, very different result. That's true. That's you, true. You were nominated... But, for best newcomer, and you were up against who? I don't remember. I really don't remember. I, maybe Jennifer Lawrence. Jennifer Lawrence for Winter's remember. Bone. Uh, Jennifer Lawrence's agent came up to me after who? Somebody's agent. I think it was. I don't remember who. Somebody's agent came up and made a comment to me like, "Oh, it's it's it's." Good that it's nice that they let you win because nobody's ever going to see or hear of you again. He made a comment like that to me, but he said it with like a big smile on his face, mm-hmm. patting me on the back. Yeah. But really, it's, I swear, these things are so, like, I don't, I never think about that stuff at all. What I was going to say, as far as the acting stuff goes and whether I was going to act again, uh, when I was out for the Spirit Awards, there were agents that were uh, pursuing me with no, like, no great verve. They were just pursuing me because maybe I might win and which again, I didn't, but maybe I might. And then, so then maybe that there would be, I, maybe I would be something that could be, uh, monetized. And so everybody was like talking to me. You know, it's like, it's hard to, um, hard to resist some, some of that talk because people are telling you that you're going to essentially make a lot of money. And I was staying at a friend's house and my friend had a beautiful home and mm-hmm. I was there with Mary and we had a, a one-year-old, our one-year-old with us. And I'm like thinking, Oh, you know, right away mentally, I'm already starting to like cash checks uh, mm-hmm. that would arrive from opportunities that hadn't even been offered to me yet. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I just started like, uh, like I, I, that, that, that space in my brain just was like alive it was growing and I was sent out on one audition for a television show. I don't even know if it ever made it to the air. It was a, it was a show that was, you know, if David Lynch has Twin Peaks, this was Gus Van Sant's show. Mm-hmm. And I was given sides for the first time. And I, uh, I, um, I, worked, uh, I worked very, very hard to memorize these sides and to get them. Like I broke each word down into... Uh, into into like syllables right Mm -hmm. almost like i could so that i could say them so fast in my mind i can do it like uh like uh i was an auctioneer and then i got very comfortable with saying it so fast that then it was like automatic in my brain and then i could slow it down and kind of surf through it and try to find some kind of add some nuance to it and whatever i was i don't know what i stayed up all night studying the stupid thing and i was brought into a room with gus van sand and like six other people and I went and I, I did this audition and it was my only audition that I've ever really done. And when I was finished, everybody, like everybody was just staring at me. You know, there was a, it was, it was odd. I could not tell if I had completely embarrassed everyone in the room or whether I had done something special. And they said to me, Oh, you read the wrong part. You read the wrong part. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And I was so, <laughs> I said, okay, uh, uh-huh. I'm going to go then. I'm going to go. 
you know, and, <laughs> I'm gonna go. and that was it. Like, that, <laughs> and that was the, <laughs> that was it. It was the end of I, your acting I career. Never, yeah. I, I, I never, uh, I never acted again. I never, what happened was that agent that had kind of blown so much smoke into my ear was like, what you need to do is you need to go home and you need to get a headshot. That's what mm-hmm. you need to do. And you need to get me this headshot right now because, you know, uh, uh, while there's still sort of energy around uh, surrounding your name. And mm-hmm. I said, okay, okay. I, I didn't you know, know anything about headshots. So I asked Benny to do the headshot for me. And he did. I didn't, wasn't happy with the results, but it now existed. Was this one of those and ones I where in one off. you're a cop and the other one you're a doctor? And the other one, you're kind of like Emmett Kelly, like the the hobo yeah, clown. Yeah, it looked like the cover of you know the Village People's Go West. It looked so you, like that. You were like all of the characters the, on three boxes. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, so so I sent it off. She was put me in such a she she had set me on this task, uh, and uh, and and you know made it seem that it was so pressing that I do this and deliver this to her so quickly. And I did, and I handed it to her and then she didn't call me back. And then, you know, you're in a position that I'm, I sent you this and then you're sending another email. I hope you got it. And then once, you know, once that's what anxiety is for me, you know, am I supposed to send another email? At what point do I become annoying? You know, uh, <laughs> things that are right on the grasp of my control but just outside my control. But there's the sense that if I do things this way or that way, I will be able to gain control over it. That's anxiety. Yeah. So I don't have anxiety when I go on an airplane because I have no, I know, in, in, I know right away that I have no, um, I have no uh, control over the outcome. Mm-hmm. But things like that, they drive me crazy. And so finally, you know, she wasn't responding to me. I called her, I said, you know, you told me, I, it's been a week now, you told me I had to get this to you. And she let me have it. Who do you think you are? You think you're some big name because you blah, 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 did this, that. You, you know, you, you're going to learn something about this town. And I mean, she just, she just steamrolled right over me. And uh, that was it. That was it. I never, I was like, I'm not doing this. I'm not going, I'm not going nothing to do with acting. But thankfully, between the acting and the writing and the directing contributions I had made to Daddy Long Legs in a very organic way, our relationship just sort of calcified yeah. over into a, a, a weird hive mind. And it's just that's what we've done without question. That's what we've done on all these features yeah. ever since. No, that and, and look, everybody loves them. And um, it, it, you've got proof. You've seen me watch. Uh, uncut gems. I was riveted to my seat. You know, you know how I actually feel about it because you stared at me watching it. Um, the only time I've ever done that. Well, I'm glad it was me. To anybody. The, was it, yeah. Should we do that call we talked about? Oh, you know, hang on one second because uh, you know Josh. Josh had you know Josh pranked. Oh. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. He went to bed. He went to bed. God damn it! Yeah. No, we we're gonna prank yeah. Josh. Um, can't do it. He yeah. just texted me because I told him I didn't want to tell him what it was. Uh huh. But uh, I told him I said around ten fifteen. I didn't realize that I was gonna be speaking first. And well, it's probably it because I said to him, "Look, I'm gonna have to, you know, whatever." Well, I just told him to stay up without giving him a good sure. reason for it. Wow. Now just wrote, "You, you blew it." I. You well, said ten something. You were so, too interesting, you Ronnie. Well, can we prank Benny? <laughs> um, mm, we'll prank him. I think he's in. He's in production. Yeah. No, don't. We're not going to bother either of them. We'll yeah, prank you, them another. You all time. blew it. You blew it by letting me. I'm such a gas bag by just letting no, me look, go on and on. So there you go. Well, let's do this. Why don't you call back next week? We'll prank him next week. When they don't expect We'll do it another time. We'll do it another time. We'll prank them. Everybody wants to. Because they used to prank me. Josh used to call a show and argue about basketball with me when he was in high school. That was one of the things that Josh and Benny and I bonded over when we first got to know one another. We were both um, just, just, you know, crazy fans of yours. Yeah. And you actually put your money where your mouth is. Uh, You and Mary both put your money where your mouth is with that. 
That's up to you. Is it simply by calling in? No, no, by listening to the best show during some very special family moments. Oh, that's right. That's right. Um, you're talking about the birth of Stay? Yes. I didn't want to say it. You literally were listening okay, to the- I'm not a, One of the few things in life I'm not ashamed of, you know? Literally listening to me make fun of what? Steve Martin playing banjo? Yes. During the birth school, of your child. Right. I had made Mary a mix while she was, you know, having her C-section. Mm-hmm. And that mix was entirely, uh, you know, built upon your mind and your voice. So there you go. Well, that's the greatest compliment. I was there for the birth of your child. I was the, the audio accompaniment. That's the nicest thing I could ever hear. Look, Ronnie. Yeah. You know, I called the show one time. One time I called the show. You, you know called about one. This? I, ever, I can't remember if I've ever texted you about this. You told me, and I think you, Cree, you, you led the way to a kind of historical moment. I think so. What happened was, you know, I worked, I always worked on Tuesday nights, and uh, I never got to listen live. Uh, and, uh, I was at the Museum of the Moving Image. I was projecting, and I was able to listen live. And one of the things I had always um, clocked on the show was any time Mickey Dolan's name came up, you just sort of let out a, a, a very bitter sigh, but never commented on it. Uh-huh. So I finally had an opportunity to call in, and I asked you about it. Uh-huh. And uh, you hung up on me. Yeah, we, we started talking about the monkeys, and I think I said something stupid. I, I said, uh, I think I said that uh, Peter Tork was the uh, uh, Zappo Marx of the monkeys. Uh-huh. And I, I'm trying to explain, you know, the, the, this person who w- wasn't funny at all, but when he wasn't in the group anymore, the group started to suck. Yeah. And you didn't like that. You didn't like that I, you know, besmirched Peter Tork. You hung up on me. But after that week, then when you hung up, you then told the story about your interaction with Mickey Dolan's. And then it just, you know, became kind of a late motif of the show. Absolutely. So I felt like, oh, I, you know. well, you were Ronnie, you and I were destined to be friends and we are, and that's oh. one of the, and on a, you're, you're a sweetheart and you're one of the, you're a very important person to me. And that's one of the nicest things that has come out of, the doing the best show. One of the many gifts that I've been given is, is, uh, getting to know you. So on a seer, on a, on a heartwarming Sammy maudlin note, I will say that. And everybody's excited about what's, whatever's coming next. Everybody's on the edge of their seat and we're working on it. We're working on it. Everybody knows they're working on it. You heard it. That's the scoop. They're working on it. Is that fair to say that's the scoop? scoop. What's that? Yeah. You're working on two? working on scoop. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, that's the name of it. Scoop. Great. You're going to remake the Woody Allen movie Scoop? No, it's ice cream. Ice cream movie. Okay. Remember when he had that movie where it was just like him and they sold, they made cookies or something? It was just like, it might be time. I, I checked out. I checked out. I think I checked out way past where I, you know, where, where I, where I, where I, <laughs> where he was where like, I, should have. I think curse of the Jade Scorpion was the first one where I said, there's no way, there's no way. But there was the one when it was just like, it's like, we're going to start a bakery and make cookies. Him and Tracy <laughs> Ullman. Made uh, that's cookies. real. Yeah. I think that's what I think they made cookie. I think they started a bakery in it. It's just like, that's the one where I ju- you just want to kind of be like, maybe you need to read this Sid Field book and just learn about beginning, middle, and end of stories because these don't have them anymore. Like, and then we try to rob the thing and then we start a bakery. What? A bakery? <laughs> I, I You could be making this up. Oh, and, uh, Ronnie, I am not that imaginative. 
I don't have that. That's the way a little kid tells a story where they're like, and then we started to rob the bank, the thing, and we broke in, and then we started a bakery, and we made cookies. Like, this is a 90-year-old man telling stories the way a child does. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I, I I abused my relationship with the good movies he made. Yeah, I abused my relationship with him and with those movies, and I was out. Well, uh, long ago. Well, Ronnie, if anybody wants Thank you to for see, having me. of course. Look, you're the greatest. Frownland is is an experience. Everybody's got to see it. I love it so much. I've seen it so many times. It's it's worth you got to take the dive and you got to see what you make of it. I think it's amazing, and I think everybody who listens to this show is going to get into it big time, and everybody should check it out. And uh, we well, will talk very well, soon. Thanks. I also just I want to just say thank you to uh, the listeners. I'm not a comedian, and I I uh, I hold this show in such high regard that uh, you know I never I just it makes me uncomfortable to participate in it. It's like being called up on stage at a magic show when you're a kid and you don't want everyone looking at you. You know what uh, I mean? You, you were great. So, uh, it was great. I had a, such a great time. That's you, you don't worry about anything. I had such a fun time and no worries. All right. We'll Thanks keep talking. Everyone. All right, buddy. Talk to you later. Bye. All right. Bye. See ya. That's exciting. We've got Ronnie Bronstein. We were going to prank Josh Safdie, but he went to bed. We'll get him again. We'll get him when he least expects it. Right. Is that how we'll do it? Got cut out of that cartoon. <gasps> and Ant-Man 3 on the same day. <gasps> how am I supposed to keep going? How am I supposed to keep going? Best show. Hi, Tom. Hi. Who's this? This is Colette from Athens. Colette from Athens. How are you? Doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good, Tom. Things are good. No, this is this is your time. This is your time, Colette. This is your yeah, time. Yeah, I, I agree. This is my time. And it's very exciting. I'm tracking you. You got a cool job, and you are moving to a cool place, and... You're 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 in for a really fun a really fun chapter of your life, Colette, is about to happen and is already happening. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. Do you have something for the t- Can you believe I got cut out of Ant Man three in on the air? Uh, no, I can't, but you know, there's always Ant Man four. Uh there's always Ant Man five, oh, Ant Man and Quadrophenia. There's always um, Ant Man Four. <laughs> there, there'll be an Ant Man Four. I, I just like the idea that you said, "Man, eh, there's always Ant Man Four. That's like that's like <laughs> weird grandparents' advice. Like, there's always Ant Man Four. That's me having faith in your ability to get cut from Ant Man Four. Yeah, exactly. You know what I'm gonna do? Here's what I'm declaring what it that? right now. I'm going to direct Ant-Man 4. I'm going to steal a job right from him. I'm going to direct Ant-Man 4, and I'm going to cast him in Ant-Man 4, cast Peyton in Ant-Man 4, and guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to not cut him from it. You're going to cut him? No, I'm not. I'm not. Keep him on his toes. He's going to be in it. He's going to think, oh, you're going to cut me from this. Wedding for months. No. Do you have something on topic, uh, Colette? I do, I do. Um, About the dumb things when you believed young, when you were a kid. The dumb things you believed when you were a kid. What do you got, Colette? When I was young, I believed that I was related to Paul Rogers of Bad Company. Hold on a second. You bring this news to me as a call <laughs> and not as <laughs> an entire podcast series? Where we could do this should be I mean, this should be the serial of the best show world that you thought you were how, related to Paul Rogers. 
You, did you think you were Paul yeah. Rogers' child? Okay, no, but my dad's name is Paul Rogers. No. Oh, okay. So well, now it's. I. I thought that everyone with the same last name had to be related to each other. And I thought everyone who had the same exact name were like super related to each other. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, it was pretty bad because I, I was in elementary school when I thought this and like why I knew who bad company was, uh, in like, you know, the mid nineties is is beyond me. Like, I think it was just like a classic rock staple. So like, you know, I was five years old and listening to can't get enough of your love. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like I, I would like tell my friends I was like, yeah, I'm related to this cool guy from like Britain, like like this overseas. Like his name is Paul Rogers. He's in a band called Bad Company, and like they all looked at me like glass eyed because they had no idea what any of those words meant. Like England, foreign concept, Bad Company, who knows? Paul Rogers, like whatever. And you know, then I'd be like, oh, yeah, uh, Bad Company. I'm sorry. Like you might know him from Free, uh, but that didn't work. <laughs> Just got stuck. Um, like, yeah, oh, he did, then he was in like, the firm. He did the firm with Jimmy Page uh, after that, and then uh, <laughs> that didn't work out. Then he was in Queen for. So, you thought Paul Rogers was your uncle, or did you never even piece know what together? You just didn't even go <laughs> far enough with it. But you yeah, were convinced. Like it was like nebulously related somehow. Sure. Well, that one, Colette. That's a good one. I like it. Yeah, it's it's pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's yeah. Bad company's great though, so yeah. I should be related to him. Well, Colette, you're killing it right now, and I'm happy for you. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about these exciting adventures as they all go your way. We're all in <laughs> All right, I'll I'll keep you in the loop, Tom. Please do. Okay, thanks so much for calling, Claude. I'll talk to you soon. Yep, have a good night. Bye. I uh, I will be right back. Let's play some music. Can't think of a more appropriate song than this one. Yeah, yeah, I went from the one to the other, right? <laughs> I can't even play the right song. I'm gonna murder somebody. Somebody's getting murdered. The first cut is the deepest. And it jumped, it played for three seconds of it and jumped to Lady Darbinville. <laughs> I hate it. Hate all of it. Cut from this, cut from that. Cut, cut, cut. Cut, cut, cut. Cut me from everything. I'm going to start cutting you all from everything. So you all like it. You're cut. Cutting me from everything. Never experienced anything this embarrassing my whole life. Cut from Ant-Man 1. Cut from Ant-Man 2. Cut from Ant-Man 3. Cut from the cartoon. Cut, cut, cut. I feel like bleeping, uh, like I might as well be uh, the guy from, uh, what is his face? Uh, uh, Phantom Thread doing all the cutting. He didn't do as much cutting as I'm getting. Fabric. What's his name? Pantman. Right? Pantman. <laughs> Thank you. Now they put a quantum mania logo up yeah now what was that what was the thing yeah that that's i just i just want to say i forgive you so you think i made all this happen i by making one i forgive you Tom. one joke at your expense i forgive you thank you i appreciate it cut 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 I'm crying in my car tonight crying see how they like it now I'm going to get them all back I'm going to burn every one of them every last one of them is going to pay every last one of them 
Best show. Hello, best show. Hello, best show. Ah. Fooey. All right. One more call. Hello, best show. Hi, Tom. It's Ben. Oh, hi, Ben. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Good, good. A I'm good glad. night tonight until I heard about my, and my condolences on, on uh, Ant-Man cut. On um, Ant-Man and the cartoon that I just also just found that I got cut from too. So. Oh, that's. Oh, yeah, that one too. Yeah. I'm sorry to hear. Thank you so much. But I, uh, I have, I have some, uh, some very interesting uh, dumb things I used to believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, as with yours, they're both geography related. Okay. Okay. What do you got? What do you got? So the first is kind of similar to what many of us grew up thinking about the whole digging a hole and you'll go all the way to China. Mine was that and this was, I believe, my parents told me this to warn me to stay away from the uh, basement sinks. There were some medium to large basement sinks with tubes coming out. I don't know how common these were, but I've seen them in a few houses later, later on. But first one I saw in my home growing up scared me. The first one you saw of a basement that, sink. And what did you think was going on with the basement sink? I would, uh, if that, if I got too close, I would fall in, uh, I would die and my body would find its way all the way to China through a sink. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's that, what I believe. That's some good old fashioned kid fear. Yep. Yeah. That's a spooky one. Uh, yep. Uh, my second one yeah, is, uh, wasn't a fear one, but it was a very weird way that I thought that the earth was, uh, I never believed in anything like a flat earth, but I did. I, for several years, I was very interested in earth and space and things, but I couldn't realize exactly how the earth, how people worked on. I'll put it this way. I used to believe people lived inside the earth and that all of our outdoor experiences out here were actually inside the earth. And whenever we saw the sun or the moon in the sky, that was just a small hole on the outside of the crust of the earth, letting light in. That's freaky. Yeah. I guess I was so, I was so having a tough time believing that people were in space. And I guess my, my, were really my explanation, my rationalization of it now ahead of time is, oh, I didn't know what the atmosphere, that, that there was this thing called the atmosphere, but when I was six, seven, eight, I, I believe that. So we think about the earth. Those are good ones. You had a lot of, yours were spooky. You were scared and were thinking about the world as a weird place, huh? Yep. And yeah, now as time goes on, the world's weird, but for different reasons. Yeah. The world caught up to your, uh, weird, uh, childlike ruminations. I, sometimes I worry if I, if I think it that way. Yeah. Well, I can't believe they cut me. That's what I'm thinking about. I'm so sorry. I'm kind of listening to you and I'm kind of just thinking about that I got cut from two things on the air tonight. Two things. Two. They cut yeah, me. That's sad. I do think he'll you bounce seem, back from it. You're you right, best. You don't seem that sad. You don't seem that sad. Because I know you're going to bounce back. Get off my from it. phone. How dare you? Yeah, that's a, don't worry, Tom. It's okay. Yeah, that's a bummer. <laughs> Stupid. 
Don't do sing songy to me when I'm down. Cut me from these things. Ant Man, I'm supposed to be in that Ant Man. Sold my lottery ticket. I'm driving in a car with one of the Walton Goggins goons. Then a big scene, supposed to kick the movie off, then get freaking COVID at a Dinosaur Jr. show. Just sue Dinosaur Jr. T. Sharpling V. J. Mascus. L. Barlow. Murph. I don't know what Murph's name is. Murph. <laughs> Just sue Murph. Just let Lou and Jay off the hook. Just gonna sue Murph. Ninety million dollars. Why is this guy suing me? Who? He bought a ticket to the show and he got COVID. Now he's suing me for ninety million dollars. Yeah, I'm suing Murph from from uh, Dinosaur Junior. You better lawyer up, buddy. Better lawyer up. I'm coming for you legally. Coming for you. Yeah, I'm getting out of here. It's my theme. And how? Wait, I'm not the scissor man. I'm not the one doing the snipping. I'm the one. I'm I'm the shrub in Edward Scissorhands. I'm bleeping shrub. Yeah, fooey. A pox on all your houses. Best show back next week.